I went into the book as a way out of myself, my world, the one I was responsible for creating or at least participating in. It was just a book and it was on sale, half of half the original price, but a bargain even at twice the full price. I didn't know what to expect. I know what I felt before going into it. I knew what I'd been through when they charged me with sedition, heresy, stripped me, degraded me, spat at and laughed at and peed on. Branded a schismatic, tortured on the rack, sparing only my right arm so I could sign a fucking confession as I meditated and typed out in my head my miseries like Solzhenitsyn with his gulag. But I refused to sign, so I didn't need to ask God for mercy for succumbing to a physical weakness in confessing to crimes. I actually called blessings and gifts. And I had stopped believing in a God I never once saw intervene to make a bad good or turn a nightmare into a dream. It's not like the opportunities weren't there. God, God had many chances. He just never took one, it seems. And so with pus between their ears, they chained me to a cross and lit a cozy fire beneath me. No time to take in the pain and smell of burning flesh. I was too busy working on another meditation, celebrating the faith in myself, burning on the same spot where I had apparently lit the bonfire of vanities and burned the occasions of sin. It was a tit for tat, you know? And the burning took several hours. My remains were hammered into fine dust and mixed with sawdust, just in case a tiny recognizable piece might be retrieved by some fanatic and give new life to a movement that never was. They stood on the Ponte Vecchio, told me to go fuck myself, and threw me into the Arno. But this is not 1498, the high renaissance of executions, and that never happened to me, literally speaking. The amateur theater we call professional can barely bring words off a page, actions, even the most evil kind are way over its head and beyond its capability, comfortably numb and each day, one day closer to death, which is why the book made sense to me. Buried alive, our most primal fear. Bad enough when it's you, but what if the buried alive were your child? It's always somebody's child, even if they're 90. In the mid-19th century, 10 out of every 100 people were apparently buried before they were dead. No joke. Medieval journals, you know, newspapers, fiction were filled with such stories. The proof, the number of skeletons found in horrible contorted positions inside their coffins. More proof, too many cadavers eating their shrouds, fingers and arms. One man devoured his entire body. This pastime by cadavers was even given a cute name, masticatio mortuorum. No joke. And no question that these noisy cadavers, moaning and groaning from their tombs, chewing and snacking on their bodies and through wood, were still alive when buried. You know, in those days, the absence of a heartbeat was the accepted sign of death, but an extremely unreliable one. And it was known that people could live for days, even months, without a heartbeat and respiration. Even now, perhaps. A frightening thought. Today, embalming in funeral homes, offering speedy service, eager for dead money, have significantly reduced the number of premature burials. But in the days of Edgar Allan Poe and Dickens, security coffins with strings from toes to bells and air holes to save prematurely buried people were popular. But not everyone could afford one. In one masterpiece of horror, a pregnant girl whose pitiful groans from the grave were ignored for hours by a frightened and superstitious church caretaker had given birth to a child in her coffin. Both died. But premature burial can exist while the still living dead walk the earth and phone in their lives, floating coffins in a sea of time. Strange, you know? Many people who die probably wouldn't mind waking up from their death and take another crack at life, so we say. Yet many people, while living, prefer to be dead. Carl Menninger, in his life-affirming book on suicide, challenges most people's declaration of life, listing the too many things people do daily that actually accelerate death way sooner than they had booked it. Where culture is concerned, Canadian or Italian-Canadian, we belong to a significant period, the flip side of the Renaissance, the buried alive age. Jane Jacobs called it the dark age ahead, her account of our culture's dead end. But she believed in the possibility of a paradise, if only we recognize the signs of decline in time. But how, Jane, how? When Miranda is no longer Prospero's innocent but wise daughter of wonder, goodly creatures, beauteous mankind in a brave new world that has such people in it. When she's no longer, indeed, the top of admiration, worth what steers to the world, but an Antonio, the treacherous brother of Prospero who believes the world has done him wrong, owes him, and will fucking pay for it. 
If new friends is what you're looking for, don't take my word for it. And here's a Calabrian proverb on friends to rival any Shakespeare. Know your friend and leave him. <laughs> friends, a Kipling cos, slowing down his slithering and mesmerizing you with trust in me. Please laugh. This letter doesn't offer many. Let it out, please. Help yourself to some air, too. I plan to suck up the rest of it for the next little while. You know, artists instinctively see, are trained to see defects. Most society is trained or prefers to look the other way. What separates the artist from others is rarely the talent and often the quality and depth of perception, which in itself is a talent. Many quote Dante, know him, or forget. Few know that Dante was condemned to exile, a form of death, and then to perpetual exile, and then condemned to death a sentence that extended to his sons, that he wrote his Commedia, the greatest poem ever written, while living in exile, that it's autobiographical, the journey of a man to find himself and make himself after having been cruelly mistreated in his homeland, that he wrote his masterpiece on the move, even on the run, sometimes hungry and threadbare, and that he wrote in his regional dialect, being one of the first to break from writing and publishing in Latin, and not with a laptop and spell check, not even an Underwood, Smith Corona, or an Olivetti, but a feather, plucked from a bird, shaved of its plume and feathery bits, cut, slit, sharpened at its tip, and dipped into black liquid minerals and earths. How many dips, how many sharpenings, how many fuck inking and paper to bind those fucking words? And by appropriating the vernacular, he established a Tuscan dialect as the standard for Italian, and that the hell in his poem was the reality in his homeland, Florence, as he perceived it. You know, were Dante born into an Italian-Canadian family, even an educated one, there would be no Dante, only a hell he would not be there to document. <laughs> or trained or forced to document the advice of others, he would have written the best TV commercials, you know, or run a humongous advertising agency, or a community newsletter, you know, or paper, you know, the kind no one reads, but everyone looks at. <laughs> a photo album of well-fed rosy pig smiles in ill-fitting suits and allegory gowns, you know, hugging a prosciutto, a provolone, or a politician, jam-packed with ads and feel-good articles on prosciutto, provolone, and politicians the kind that contribute to the culture of make-believe we have a culture. Thank God Dante lived when he did, and too bad he didn't live in our time. And thank God that before exile and after, he had patrons and funding. Funding from fundus, bottom, piece of landed property, the bottom or lowest part, foundation or basis, building, Laying down foundations. We know a lot about that. You know, Italian Canadians have practically built the early arteries that connected this province and country roads and highways. And together with their Chinese Canadian counterparts, they became the surgeons of the land, using only muscles from the neck down, and laid down the railway tracks for an entire country the veins, arteries, uh, uh, capillaries, nervous system, arteries, all of that in one while debating who came first, the noodle or the spaghetti, you know? <laughs> and of course, we build buildings and homes, still do. At times, we build so much, too much. We deprive front lawns of lawn, weeds, and flowers, and were it not for Italians' obsession with marble and tiles, we'd be eating out of fucking cement plates, sitting in cement chairs, gathering around cement tables, sleeping in cement beds. That way, no one can argue the strength and durability of the home. Try to tsunami this, God. Come on. In fact, our relationship is always with God, the ultimate builder of things. And though we know we won't last as long as God, we're always willing to give him a good run for his money. And so we build up sideways, cantina so deep, you need an elevator to go down. You think you're in a Belgian mine. Like you were bringing coal back up to the kitchen table, not wine or sausages. Oh, God, can we build? And we know how to build centers for the old and the sick, and we need them, community centers and cultural ones, and theaters, and we need those too. But as I said to a distinguished guest at the Centro Calabria fundraiser, treasures of the community, your worship mayors, distinguished nuns, honorable honorables, all sucking on distinguished Belgian chocolates, at tables baptized with names like Ugo Tognazzo, Alberto Sordi, the list goes on, superb talents whose time was in the past, even in the country that was home to their art. As I said to all of that, what will inhabit the space is made of other stuff, not what and who built it, though that should count, but doesn't. When we travel to the four corners of the world, we're drawn to a particular place by climate or art or both. We understand people mainly through their works of art, and we silently or quietly judge them based on the works of art they've produced or failed to produce over years and centuries. We, as Italians living in Canada, as Canadians, will be judged in the same way by future generations. I mean, there's something fundamentally wrong with a community, a city, or a country that doesn't appropriate and promote its own culture that doesn't discuss culture seriously. Welcome to Mars, 
where most agree identity is not an issue. English Canada shamelessly promotes the glories and virtues of British or American theater and film and all media at the expense of its homegrown talent and art. And the Italian community apes the mainstream by promoting all things an artist Italian from Italy, especially its glorious past, in the hope of selling more of whatever it's trying to sell. Papers, ad shoes, trips, appliances, pasta, and all that prime rib self-confidence that sprouts from that. The culture of the immaculate triad. Nostalgia, lard, and victim. And though so proud to be anything but who they are, you know, still ashamed of being of Italian in a post ashamed period, who cherry pick a pass and they sell as holy bread, or glorify their names like a duce did with Caesar, or anglicize their names while dunking donuts in red wine when no one's looking, as that's all they need to feel culturally connected, you know? And those who say they are being who they are, authentic to themselves, who studied creative writing and remind you with their writing. Rich in proper grammar, great attention to punctuation without offending a comma or a period, who've mastered an English on stilts, English on eggshells, English with a lisp, English with an over-enunciated limp, English for the English on a platter, feudal English, like a fine coat for special occasions and not a living organ, and now teach it to their children, preach their narrow as universal, blame the mainstream for their minor everything, and forget that even an imprisoned body carries a free mind, free to express the authentic self. How amazing these authentic writers who pass on irony the way a body deals with gas, who condemn, over defend or deny the plastic on new furniture. They can't see the why in the preservation symbol of new world prosperity. And now apply that plastic to their authentic writing. Preserve a victim template they've come to like, depend on even market. And those beyond, you know, who move and groove, Beyond the experience, beyond one ethnic and trade in the liquid stuff, you know, that flows between the ethnics. You think they're talking diarrhea? Fuck the village, give me the global, man. You know, those ones? And they give you headaches instead? Yeah, that's bound to galvanize a new generation of Italian Canadians to do something fucking artistic with their lives. But encouraging young Italian Canadians to pursue a life in the arts, you know, does not come easy to older Italian Canadians, especially parents, even educated ones. You know, there are too many untold stories where parents would sooner murder suicide their entire family than risk the embarrassment and shame of having an artist in the family. It's like an illness, quasi-terminal. You know, and then the horror of having to deal with a lineup of people and relatives who visit the house asking the dreaded question, how's your son doing? Better? Well, how's he doing? You know, the same. He reads, he writes, he paints, plays a bit of music, you know, his guitar, piano, and the violin that cost him a fortune cost him us! We don't have one day of peace. I'm already on heart pills. I don't know what to do anymore. It's going to kill me. And the doctor, what's the doctor going to tell you? You know, he's like that. There's nothing you can do about it. You know, no vitamins, no medication, nothing. A ruined life. We have to resign ourselves to that. Every family has its tragedy. He's ours. It's a wonder that any Italian Canadian excels in the arts. And when they survive the civil war in their own home, assuming they come out of it in one piece and sane, and have the luxury of spending more time in the real world than in a shrink's office, they hit the street looking for support and funding, knocking on doors. In the Calabria I left in 65, musicians, buffoons, and charlatans still came knocking at the door and played their music, danced in open areas, and told some jokes for a slice of bread or a glass of something. It was always fun for us kids, and perhaps a great reminder to our parents why the decision to leave was the right one. Today, we're much more sophisticated in how we apply our craft and wear, and how we encourage people to support and encourage the artist. We even PhD, the gathering of vital information on folklore, folk songs, on those buffoons I left behind in a Calabria that also left them behind. Today, the world got bigger and we fit our thinking to size. The doors we knock on got bigger too. The people who answer those doors don't go by name, first or last, no, but by titles. Officer, executive director, assistant to the executive, chief executive officer, chairman, co-chair, president, vice president, partner, partner, and there are many more. And they don't answer the doors, no, because we don't knock on them the way we used to. We send them an email that stares at them in the face, you know, even before they've had the chance, you know, to have a coffee, even before their eyes can look like eyes, even before they wipe the sleep off their faces as they stare back at the computer, not quite sure who, when, where, what, what, what's this? That's the best case scenario. In reality, it's usually the receptionist who informs you of the dates, deadlines, amounts, on letters of recommendation, if you need them, and if you're required to supply a sample of your work how much is too much or too little, what the norm is when the jury committee meets, because the first door you knock on, if you're an artist, is the Arts Council. Funding agencies and arts councils, a tough one, you know, but when it happens, it's like religion. You see a miracle and you say, hey, maybe there's a God. 
And you begin to readapt to the world as a believer. But too many days without miracles go by, not just for you, but too many people. And so you go back to believing you don't believe. And this time you really believe it until the next miracle. And then you believe all over again. But then there's another dry period, longer than the previous ones. So you stack your bedside table with Thoreau and Emerson, and soon enough it becomes pretty clear that self-reliance is the way to go, was always the way to go, and that your uneducated, knife-sharpened lapis of a father, who all his life signed his name like a ransom note, was ahead of his time. And when he said, don't trust anyone, not even Jesus Christ, he was quoting Thoreau and Emerson without even knowing it. In fact, self-reliance, Emerson's first lesson was the one your peasant father taught all his life. And when Emerson put his ear to the ground and listened to what nature had to say, it was your father's voice that spoke the words, all that Adam had, all that Caesar could, you have and can do. Build, therefore, your own world. I mean, since when did you see your father count on a stroke of luck to raise his spirits or to create his world? Was it not his poor tongue that gave Emerson these rich words, nothing can bring you peace? but the triumph of principles. Well, with that under your belt, you know, knocking on any arts council door can be pretty unpeaceful, but you go for it, you know, nevertheless, you, you, you want legitimacy and acceptance, and so you go big, medium, and small all at the same time. The federal, provincial, municipal arts councils, you hit them all like a bank robber, having studied the plans like an architect. You ask for something without missing an opportunity to tell them something in the process, hoping to expand their rigid definitions of multiculturalism, Canadian, and community. The Canada Council tells you that, oh, the Peer Assessment Committee recognized the merit of your application and recommended financial support. A grant could not be awarded due to lack of funds. They hope you will nonetheless be able to find the means to achieve your artistic objectives sincerely. And they PS you with this, your peers, Tony, they decide, remember that. If they think it's art, it must be art and yours isn't. The Ontario Arts Council regrets to inform you that your request for assistance has been denied by a jury that could not respond positively, so responded negatively. Given the council's strategic plan, program criteria, and range of applications, they wish you well in your artistic endeavors, underemphasizing artistic and overemphasizing endeavors, and sign off with yours sincerely. The Toronto Arts Council, not wanting to be the schlemiel in all of this, you know, the odd man out, toes the line and practically steals one from the OAC. They too regret to inform you the committee did not recommend a grant in support of your project. In fact, they agreed on one thing, to not support it. And they rub it in and tell you you can appeal this recommendation. They should have used verdict. In private, they tell you that, you know, the batting average for appeals, not too bad. You know, only slightly worse than getting the Bonanno family to reverse a decision and render a contract on someone's life null and void. But people, who oh, oh, they've won appeals, Tony. The last one was in 1880. L'anno de Jesu Cristo, anno dominus, as my father used to say. I mean, here's a sizable stuffing for this turkey on councils. And if I fail to justify any part of this, please, you know, bring back the glory days of public executions and shoot me. The councils have had, you know, they've been having a great time with me lately, the way a cat plays with a mouse, you know, to the finish. The OAC in particular is such a fan, you know, they took the trouble to send me their rejection letter twice, two years in a row. That's right, it's a one-two combination meant to keep you down and out, you know. It's the bureaucratic equivalent of a swarming. You know, it's taking care of an applicant the way Santino Corleone took care of his brother-in-law, you know, with a metal garbage lid to the head, you know, to the head, to the head, to the head. But I was wrong. The two rejection letters were for two different projects. In other words, the OAC did not have a problem with one project twice, but with two projects, period. Two letters and, and counting. It was their way of telling me, hey, this town is not big enough for the two of us, Tony, and one has to leave, okay? But even a judge would understand my confusion. I mean, the two rejection letters were identical, typed out by the same office assistant and signed by the same theater officer in green ink. The color of prosperity, just to rub it in. Exactly the same letter, different dates, different projects, different juries. You, you wouldn't know it by reading the form letters, no. But the OAC guarantees that the jurors have a broad knowledge and experience of the relevant art form. Knowledge of the cultural needs of a particular region or community will provide fair and objective opinions and are able to articulate their opinions. And notwithstanding their ability to articulate their opinions, the second jury chose to send the first jury's form letter instead. Makes sense. And to preempt your cry of, hey, my right to know, okay? They supply you with names, first and last. No, no, I'd rather know what the jurors had to say than who they are. We will know who they are by what they say. Would that not be in the interest of culture? Well, in the interest of culture, as I found out later, two qualified juries believe two letters and in counting were theatrically irrelevant and lacked impact. Okay, question. 
Were the juries comprised of professional theater artists radically different than those I've worked with over the last 30 years? I mean, most of them took issue with two letters, especially those who didn't see them. Reviving the glory days of un-American activities, like scavenger raccoons that charge a green bin at night when you're sleeping, you know, cross-burning your front lawn, but scram at the first sound of your presence? Am I, not, am I not defending a case where jury, judge, prosecutor, and accused are buddies in crime? Is such a jury impartial, fair, and free of any conflict of interest? Well, if anyone had any doubts about the quality of the juries, and I did, certainly did, all you need to know is that one of those qualified juries approved funds for the production of The Amorous Servant. You know that, for lack of a better word, comedia production that spawned letter two? That production, to be fair, had just about everything in it. You know, the only thing missing in that production, to be fair, was Mickey Rooney as a yellow-faced, buck-toothed Japanese neighbor in Breakfast at Tiffany's. He would have fit right in. Other than that, the production was perfect, so perfect, it even managed to resurrect Goldoni from the fucking dead. He filed a lawsuit in an Ontario Superior Court against the theater company, its director, and the OAC. So perfect! But the only actor with any knowledge of comedia in that production considered flushing her career and craft down the toilet after the run. But wait, you know, the smiley deer in the headlights director did promise a delightful and moving comedy filled with grande passione. You know, forensics will show that the actress's problems were directly linked to the surplus of grande passione she was still carrying around, you know, after the run. You know, like a Stendhal syndrome, you know, no actor or human could take that much fucking art and beauty in one sitting and not suffer the consequences. I mean, it's a wonder she didn't faint right there on stage or die of cardiac arrest. And the jury apparently was able to see all of that, you know, all of that overwhelming art. In fact, had the production been able to secure Mickey Rooney as the bucktooth Japanese, the OAC would have doubled the amount requested. Our loss. Stuck with that kind of knowledge, I dread to think what other projects that stellar jury approved. Check your theater listings under Now Playing. Can one take the OAC to court for first degree suicide? I don't know, you know. So I made the call, you know, and I spoke with the theater officer with a green ink pen who did her best to say little. You know, I imagined her holding a gun to her own head, you know, where she told herself, just listen to the guy, don't say anything, don't say anything. And when she spoke, it was hieroglyphics, you know. I caught the word impact, and it confused me. It even bothered me, you know. The word impact clearly has a specialized meaning for the monks within the sacred walls of the OAC. Mere mortals like you and me, you know, outside those walls can't grasp what takes years to learn through long hours of daily meditation, fasting and flagellation in search of enlightenment. I mean, there's something exciting, even perverse, about this medieval moment, this gothic chick. Her logic, a dizzying maze in a Kubrick film, you know, the kind that makes you see and appreciate the bright side of mass suicide. I mean, I want to be in there, in that room, in that group, decision-making environment, you know, where jurors and advisors, high on intestinal gas, give new meanings to old words. Impact. Perfect place to light a match, you know. Impact this. The theater officer, the green ink pen, you know, did put my fears to rest when I paused between her pauses. The jury evaluates impact using specific program criteria in the context of the OAC strategic priorities. Oh, <laughs> that! Phew, for a moment I thought we weren't on the same page, you know. Of course, of course, criteria and the context thing within the, you know, strategic thing. Yeah, yeah, of course, man. I was elated, you know, like I'd been given a grant on the spot. Thank you, I said to her, thank you. I love you, I love you, I love you. And I hung up. Oh man, that clarity was like a lightning bolt. You know, I had been saved by clarity. The theater officer with the green ink pen, my clarity, man, she was so good, you know? And a good part of me was also, you know, I knew was in shock, you know? Like when I saw a decapitated body, you know, from a BMW on the gardener. And the other sign was the strong drink I had poured myself at 10 in the morning without knowing it after my chat with her. I said, okay, Tony, get a grip, review. If applicant does not have other sources of income for project in question, that's a strike against the applicant. I mean, you can't get money from the OAC if you don't have any money. Okay, what's wrong with that, Tony? No, no, wait, there is something. Wait, 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 wait. There were other sources we had applied to for two letters, the Toronto Arts Council, which we did not get, and my entire RRSP account standing by. Doesn't that count? No, last year doesn't count, Tony. It was a different crop assessed by a different jury. I know, no, no, but the fact is, sorry, Tony, the fact is we don't look at previous applications. Wait a minute! What about that I did drain my entire RRSP account to fund two letters? Sorry, Tony, we don't look at previous applications. Two letters did not draw big crowds. Okay, I agree. Well, well, Tony, it's also true that this too is a problem. I mean, is there a community anywhere for your kind of work? I mean, it's a relevant question, Tony, given our criteria. I mean, we're spending public funds, you know, it has to appeal to someone. Okay, wait, wait, the press, the press we got. No, we went over that one, Tony. A work can receive no press, small houses, and still be relevant and important. We recognize that, Tony. It's, 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 it's one of our criteria. No, no, sorry, I was wrong. 
okay, we had no fucking press, okay. But packed houses, you know, people were scalping tickets, tickets in front of the theater. We needed security to keep them away. We even had a couple of chunky crowds at Massey College. No, 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 Tony. Many theater events attract huge crowds, but it often has nothing to do with quality, Tony. We look at the artistic attributes, and sometimes even a small review or article by a competent, informed journalist critic gives legitimacy to the art in the work. One well-informed voice, Tony, can speak louder and more eloquently than 100,000. We are sensitive to that, Tony. It's one of our criteria. Good! Okay! Because Rick Salutin made some reference to that in writing about letter two. I mean, he never saw letter one. And be thankful he didn't, Tony. Had he seen it, I'm sure he would have revisited his thoughts on letter two. It's not the first time a journalist sees half a story and sells it to the public as a complete one. No, but letter two is a complete story. You know what I mean, Tony. No, no, I don't know what you mean. Well, I know what I mean, Tony. Well, wait! Tell me. Well, 30 projects were rated higher than yours, Tony, two years in a row. Live with it. Wow, are you saying 30 new theater works two years in a row? As a, well, as assessed by qualified jurors, Tony, according to the OAC criteria and strategic priorities. Yes, Tony. Can you speak English, please? Please, can you, please dial the extension or use the keypad, spell the person's last name. Wait a minute, don't! Then press pound. All right, well, that's when the pill popping starts, you know? And then the applicant left his no choice but to apply to the Arts Council for a fucking job. And he's given one, and given an office. A tiny one with a tiny view of Bloor Street, you know? But that's after 10 years. For now, just a tiny one with walls and a stack of form letters. He folds each sheet, licks the envelope, you know, and thinks of the shoppers he can't even see on busy Bloor Street, realizing that this year, for the first time in many years, he'll be able to afford Christmas gifts, but not on Bloor Street. No, 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 that's for those with a view. But damn it, he'll get there. He'll get there, goddammit. Nine more years of this and he'll get there. God damn it, he licks and licks and licks and licks, waiting for those years to fly, and they do. And finally, he's promoted to theater officer and signs his name with a green ink pen. And so I wrote to the officer with the green ink pen, dear first and last name, it is the all too true reality of Canadian theater artists in general that many don't make the kind of money that could pay for an executive assistant to type out their letters. Hence, like most, I have to type out my own. A responsible question a responsible parent could ask his, her, young aspiring artist is, is it better to be an artist in Canada or to work for an arts council? The form letter you signed in green ink confirms that those working for the arts councils don't have to ask themselves that question and never have to compose and hand in an artist's statement, that pretentious waste of time affidavit their superiors need to feel superior and use at will to gauge if the underling's execution is umbilically connected to the purpose articulated therein and whether the almighty thumb should go up or down on the public servant. God forbid. Thankfully, those working at the arts councils are protected by the much-honed gobbledygook of form letters that practically guarantees bunker-like job security and we know that our culture is safe, as safe as dead. This is not a thank you letter, by the way. I frankly wouldn't know what to thank you for. I know, I know, you know, you know how actors are. You know, we've seen their fragile egos, a pile of dried up Play-Doh. We've all seen or heard of Theater of Blood, where a vengeful Vincent Price, or was it the character he was playing? All hammy and over the top, hunts down murders one by one, a bunch of critics for the bad reviews of his work, and for denying him the much coveted Critics Award. I mean, the last thing we want, God forbid, is Tony climbing up the exterior walls of the OAC, dragging some giant rag doll with him, and yelling from the top floor at the top of his lungs like some mad leer, never, 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 never! I mean, I would be one of the first to welcome and toast 30 new relevant theatrical works a year. Surely more than 30 applicants were deserving of support and should have been funded. I mean, 30 grants, my God, for a total of 185,000 in the largest province in the land is disgraceful. I know you know that. Our Ministry of Culture, provincial or federal, is a ministry marquee. The perennial office of what could have been. More money goes to the heritage and cultural minister's expense accounts and out-of-town trips and less to artists. You know, a formal federal heritage minister was given a paltry, well, a mini fortune for too many, for a weekend in New York. Her all-important mission, on behalf of the people and artists of Canada, to check out what was happening in New York. You know, this mini trip on a shoestring budget included a bloated tab in U.S. dollars at one of the finest eateries in New York, where the minister regaled guests and waitstaff with tales about Canadian culture and her wonderful Canadian artists, you know. You know, too many down and out in the Paris and London of Canada, she probably yelled, glass in hand, and we must do something about it, she slobbered. Pass the Amarone, and one I love you too, you know. I mean, I get emotional just thinking about her love, you know. To some, 
The form letter may suggest a soft blow, soft landing, rejection slip, a white kitten on cut nail, a little tap on the bum, you know, they won't question. It might actually find comforting for its gentleness, its, its neutrality. Without fingerprints, without pointing the finger, it treats all rejected applicants equally. No bias. In fact, the failed applicants are in the majority, outnumber the winners. There is strength in numbers, perhaps even a cause for celebration. But to me, the form letter is a can of worms. Seemingly neutral and inoffensive, it's an irresponsible, cowardly, strategic alibi sponsored by fear or indifference and painstakingly or carelessly drafted by legal-like minds obsessed with looking over their shoulders. It reads like something from a pharmaceutical company, you know, with the numbing effects of the medication in question felt with the actual reading of it. In fact, the form letter is the numbing medication. Its vomit-inducing properties could spell relief for anyone who's had too much to drink. A copy should live in everyone's medicine cabinet, and every loo and every bar in the country should nail a copy to the wall by law. And drunks could vomit fest their way back to health. In that way, it's a fucking masterpiece. The form letter. You know, a self-acclaimed angry psychiatrist challenged people to cry anger, risk making statements, and stop couching their feelings in a smokescreen of polite questions that only boosts hostility and sends them running to the closest Home Depot for a noose from which to hang. I mean, you and I, but you mainly, could have gone on for hours cocktailing official OAC definitions and criteria. But we would hit a wall, and we did, when the conversation got anywhere near theater and impact of a theatrical work. If there was ever a feedback session to shame all other feedback sessions, eclipse even a Warren Commission, and galvanize an entire community of playwrights to commit 10 years of solitary confinement to rewrites ankle deep in water, no food for the first five years, and surviving solely on creative juices, that little chit chat with you was it. Man, oh man, did it set the standard, you know? I mean, George Bush's brilliant analytical and diagnostic powers came to mind as I listened to you trying to explain and clarify impact and criteria are different <laughs> as words, different spelling, a different meaning, because the words are different, and that's a problem, and you have a problem with the problem, that's a problem. <laughs> and the problem needs to be fixed, and the only way to fix the problem that needs to be fixed is to fix it, because there is a problem, by fixing the problem, the problem is no longer a problem the way the definition of problem was used prior to the problem being fixed, <laughs> you know? I mean, hot dog, fancy that. Bush must have worked at the OAC before he became commander-in-chief and governor in Texas. We know a better future is in store for Canada the day the theater officer with a green ink pen is elected prime minister. Theater officer clearly has one word too many. The first. I can only imagine the effect you have on juries with that kind of stuff. You know, the only equivalent on the spot to the expression on people's faces when Jesus fed 5,000 with five loaves and two fish, you know? Man, oh man, I love you, dear theater officer. I want you with that green ink pen clamped between your teeth like a bridle. I want you, I want to tattoo your body with my tongue and criteria. <laughs> Remove the modesty drapes over your private parts. Restore! And I can hear you responding in kind, so don't stop now. Go on, fuck the money. Just hit me with criteria again. You have no idea. And I promise to give you a sample of my work. Your angel with a spear on fire, and you, my Saint Teresa, on fire in heat, and God with my thrust in your heart, and your eyes wide open. Only rackets, brothels, and banks reserve the right to define value by winners and losers in the cold exchange of cash and form letters. The rest of society should attempt to cultivate the nuance and bathe in it, so open your legs, and I will give you my heart to hold. Laugh, it's on me. Living and breathing the Canadian cultural dream from the safe place of a bureaucratic post allows you that luxury. Take advantage of it. Others would, me too, perhaps. You know, I've had it hard with public funding, somewhere between a manual prostate exam with stick shift and a colonoscopy with no lubricant. The truth is I'm open to anyone willing to give, public or private. I take from both ends because I need both to survive and everyone gives a little enough to say they gave. No one commits a lot. It's a way of our country. And criteria has always been behind the times. Criteria is a credit card, freedom with shackles built into the fine print, a pact with a poodle that turns out to be the devil. Criteria is a corrective lens. The prescription gets stronger, but the eyes weaker until they're as good as blind. Criteria is a traveling circus that reasonably accommodates with finger to the wind of public opinion. It relies on the middle for nourishment and reinforcement like a vampire sucking on the same neck. Not much blood left. Criteria is career applicant that shapes his thoughts to fit. It's about a quality application. It's a strong bureaucrat and a weak human. Artist as a good pupil, risk-free and irrelevant. Some of the finest cultural bureaucrats actually work in professional theater. 
Even our first-rate playwrights dig only as deep as a good impression as the norm requires, mainly preoccupied with outside-looking-in theater, the theatrical equivalent of accounting, itemizing ideas and characters with the insight and emotional engagement of a servile, committed bookkeeper. Notwithstanding artist statements to the contrary, they display a relative interest in shining light on the human condition or Canadian society, often making the big picture small and not being able to suggest the big one through the small one. The last thing a Canadian theater artist wants is to be called an artist. Being labeled difficult is a close second. He desires nothing more than the sound and look normal. The word artist relates to something intangible, airy fairy, not solid, possibly pretentious and arrogant. So he shies away from the word, unaware its root relates to craft, something that is less intangible, more practical. He embraces works in instead. But his heart and soul show no signs or calluses to back his story. The artist desperately wants to be a part of a world that fails to take her seriously. She invents and generates a one-sided legitimacy scheme found on reasonable, rational language and behavior. And she creates from that, or tries to. And the world is slowly growing accustomed to artists who out-business the businessman. They're easy to chat with, uncomplicated, tough as nails, though, you know, at times. Hey, but that's business. An artist for all seasons and tastes how to get in, stay in, fit in, and last, regardless of what they do with what they do. They carve for themselves a permanent spot in the middle, the middle of everything. They are at equal distance from both ends and in nobody's way. They like it like that and the world likes that about them. And they will stay there till the day they die. But while living, they mingle mainly with business types and bureaucrats who, ironically, often think of themselves as artists, deep down inside. True artists, you know? True, I mean, they work in the cultural sector, run arts organizations, sit on boards. They chose to follow the money. The road well-traveled, and now they back the theater they were once meant to create. They sacrifice the art in themselves to support the art in others. Not with their own funds, though, sometimes, but usually the public's. It's about team playing, you know, about corporations and public institutions sleeping together, learning how to sleep together. And they broker those deals in sleepathons, hold expensive powwows at fine restaurants with mayors, directors of boards, fundraising experts, and they theme each monthly gathering. They try to define a national identity by drafting out a cultural one, set strategic priorities and criteria that the plebes will then paint by numbers. Between the rest and the 10-course meal, they talk about their travels, you know, the art and the world, that there's so much of it, my God, and not enough time in life to see it all. And then why do we prefer visiting a small town anywhere in the world over one in Canada, they ask each other, you know? They complain about our theater, that they've seen better stuff in poor South American countries. What's wrong with our theater artists? They ask no one in particular. Why the anemia? They talk about infrastructures, marketing, that our artists don't know how to organize and sell their ideas. Artists have a poor delivery system for the arts they create, they argue. And they're drowning in ideas. No, 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 no. They have no ideas. I've got an idea, says one. Let's give them ideas. Here's an idea. A contest, okay? The artist that comes up with the best idea wins something. What? I don't know, okay? A bursary for what? I don't know. Doesn't matter. That's the idea, okay? We'll have time to fine-tune it later with specifics and criteria. The winner wins a trip, okay? Let's say go to Italy to study nudes or fountains. A trip to Africa to learn about camels and dehydration. Go to Thailand to study brothels. Stare at those fucking pyramids. You know what I mean? It should be about connecting with all of that finding out how they did it, or, or no, or stay home. Now the idea man now takes the floor. No, no, they have to stay home. That's their prize, okay? Study their fucking neighborhood, that's it. They have to ask and answer kick-ass questions. You know, why are the blacks in predominantly white neighborhoods always asked about the guns and Shane and Finch? Why are the Jews asked to comment on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? It should be relevant, oh, but not depressing, okay? I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that people want uplifting stories, feel-good stories with insight. That's what people want, and that's what, what's, what's missing, okay? What do you guys think, okay? Sounds good to me, sounds good to me, sounds good to me, I agree, good, let's adjourn. And they lick the last drop of grappa, burp, and go home. I don't specialize in stats, you know, that's for your PR department to play around with and print on napkins for all those Christmas parties where giddy brains and flapping tongues out to each other with feel-good stories about OAC numbers over the last fiscal year. I mean, the state is in the statistics, and they suck. I would not ask or take one fucking penny from the OAC if I didn't think and believe the project I was working on could prove, even to the 345,000 poor Ontario children, that theater is as vital to our daily lives as food and shelter. Theater is not food in the way food is food. But that should be the energy and commitment going in. If I can't put the relevancy of my work on par with food and shelter, I'd sooner use the 36.4 million OAC budget 
to feed the poor children instead of our fucking egos. You didn't leave our phone conversation without offering me a jewel, a glimpse of hell. Your stroke of genius came when I reiterated the documentary nature of encounting, that my trying to understand what had happened to the application would be taken into account. It wasn't what you said, but how you said it. Oh, we were acutely aware of that, Tony. I mean, your we had that us versus them thing about it, you know? Not to mention your use of the word acutely. You know, strange, I thought. You know, I thought I'd made it perfectly clear in letter two that there is no us versus them. We all share responsibility for the culture we have or lack. Why a we that pits an us against a them? What could I possibly be saying in encountering that the theater officer with a green ink pen would find offensive and had difficulty or be indifferent to discussing? I mean, what could you or a jury possibly say in private about encounting that you could not fully discuss verbally or in writing and that I should not repeat or debate publicly? I thought about the lives of others, the film, and that the road to Orwell is gradual. So please laugh, it's on special. Michelangelo immortalized one of his main detractors and censors by working his semblance into a fresco as one of the damned, Minos, the judge of the underworld. Everyone's dead, the fresco lives. The Vatican versus Michelangelo, that's fucking major league. I'm no Michelangelo, but you're no Vatican. But by commissioning works, by the inventor of obscenities, as Michelangelo was often called, and able to stomach the controversy and debate, the Vatican of the 1500s makes the OEC of 2008 look like a fucking fossil. I mean, if we were ever to give birth to a cultural renaissance of any importance, the miracle would not be at the hands of an arts council. Did I say the OEC condemns works that bite even a finger that feeds them, and anyone doing so even with humor violates the Ontario Patriot Act? I don't know but committees and subcommittees often douse the fire behind the question and bury the answer under a pile of reports locked in too many file cabinets and scattered in too many offices. More politicians, bureaucrats, and associations have misspent, wasted, and stolen public funds than any artist or group of artists in the history of time. Remember that. And what they spent it on is not hanging in museums or performed in theaters or concert halls. The worst thing the OAC can do is to take more interest in the arts and less in the artist. Put the artist first and leave the art to the artist. The worst thing an artist can do is to play by the rules. They are about nothing for no one at no time. They expedite the distill organization of rows and columns, of coffins or gravestones. The art, the magic, the beauty, all in the symmetry and nothing else. The worst thing an artist can do is to be a good applicant today in hope of being a great artist tomorrow. The artist must do only what the senses do best, at their best, backed by imagination. And those who disagree with Peter paying for Paul's pleasure, state-funded arts, would perhaps be less hostile to the idea if Paul stopped doing what a dog does best, lick its own balls. So get busy. Overturn your cabinets and desk, drive your sheep and cattle out and light a match in your own office and sit there and fucking meditate and make love to the heat like a naked child in a burning slum of a distant country. Don't worry, you won't burn. And I give you my hand for when you might need it. And if we do burn, we will have earned our death and our Easter. And that's all I have to say to you, sister. And if I could afford a fancy green ink pen, I'd cross out your last name right now and write in your first. Consider it done. Sincerely. Oh, P.S. When I said between you and me over the phone and you said there is no between you and me, Tony, well, you got your wish. You know, when council doors slam shut, Canadian artists scrub floors and wash dishes. Clean is good, but not your wallet. He who has nothing loses even the little he has. You don't give the rich change, and you don't give the poor ear. A full stomach does not believe an empty one, and more proverbs on money rush in, you know, like friends. Proverbs tell you the truth and make you suffer. Enemies make you laugh with a lie. And that theater officer with the green ink pen certainly supplied the laughs at taxpayers' dollars. With money and friends, you can bust justice's ass, corrupt or even, because money has wings, and when the rich go to hell, they still find reserve seating. And debts are like death. Sooner or later, the time expires. Throw me to the fucking sea with fortune by my side. My chances are way better, you know? And so you thank your patron saint, a mortician at a hockey game here in Montreal who told you, you know, 30 years ago, that 30 years in business taught him people don't take money, don't take it, or real estate, to the grave. But wisdom makes no sense when you need it most. A council door shut is a mini death. 
with too many choices. You're in prison, but still free to roam around. And the eye candy of life doesn't allow you to reflect on any of it. You need to get arrested, you say to yourself, behind bars. You need to limit your options, confine your body for a while, and set your mind free. This moving world has made stillness move with it. And if you want to kill what's left in you, go to the theater. No human body built for that kind of anesthetic, not mine. Life, acting, writing, built on action, actioning it. From the day I was born, I seem to have lived my truest life in those moments between actions of reflection that I didn't call but came to me because I managed to stay still for a second or two in body and mind. What you are to me, Hamlet, is a thousand questions before one action. It's not uncertainty, no, it's not indecision. It's weighing and weighing and weighing and still fucking up. Something wonderfully human about that. But in Calabrian, stillness is death. And so you call it a day for that day. You know, you look at the stacks of mainstream rejections, the stationary letterhead stamps, all taxpayers' money. You throw them into the recycling bin and you consider approaching the minor stream, the Italian Canadians, the so-called community. Hey, a media sponsor would be great, you tell yourself, and normal, so you go see one. And the ethnic media guy tells you, you know, I find it surprising, Tony, that the mainstream media doesn't jump on this, Tony. You know, this project is fascinating. I saw only one of the letters, but I was so moved, Tony. I can't believe the mainstream media is not jumping on this. You know what I mean? I'm shocked, you know. We here, of course, won't be able to help you in any way, but at least not financially, you know. We don't have the money for this, Tony. Hey, let's have lunch, okay? Discuss the possibility. See what we can do, okay? In the meantime, oh, Tony, drop a budget. Okay, by all means, you know, give me a rough one, you know, so I can take it to them. But, you know, don't hold your breath. You know, they'll pull and push and say no. Then I go back to them and, you know, then they'll say maybe. And then I tell them this much. And they say it's too much. <laughs> and I say, well, how much? And you like that, Tony. You know, but I'll try, okay? Lunch or coffee, Tony. Whatever you what? Okay, I'm open, Tony. And then a long silence for weeks and counting. You go see mainstream media. Hi, Tony. I can't imagine why the ethnic media in Toronto doesn't jump all over this. You know, this seems to be right up their alley. You know, it doesn't really fit into what we're trying to do, you know, but we can definitely see the merit in the project. You know, a number of very prominent, very good journalists have written on it. it sounds great. Of course, the star guy, Fiorito, is Italian. Probably the reason he supported it so much, Tony. I mean, not that the others, I mean, I think you should really try the ethnic media, Tony. You know, they're in a much better position than we're in to do something about this. They have the money for things like that. You know, we don't. That's what they're there for, you know. We may be bigger, uh, but our mandate is also bigger. I, I don't mean bigger that way, Tony, but, you know, we're different, you know. And you look at your passport, you know, to make sure you live in the same country as the person you just spoke with. And that you didn't go to Mars during your sleep and talk to an alien, though she looked like one. And you share your thoughts with a politician at a party while high-powered movers and shakers are cementing deals and buying towns the way you buy toilet paper, you know? You look for the Achilles heel in the politician's heart, hoping to make him believe he came up with the idea you're about to suggest to him. He agrees with you, good sign. And then he tells you, Hey, Tony, we Italian Canadians, we suck, you know. We don't appreciate culture, Tony. I mean, look at him. Wealthy Italian Canadian businessman. Look, 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 you think given all the money he has, his family, you know, he's ever given a fucking pen to the arts? No, Tony, they just don't get it. We've been saying it for years, Tony. The wealthy Italian Canadians have to start contributing to the arts. We made the money. Now let's move on and move forward. They understand concrete, Tony. You can touch it. It doesn't go away. I mean, it does, but it stays a long time. You know what I mean? That, that they understand, you know. Very frustrating, Tony. But don't stop knocking at their door, Tony. Sooner or later, something's got to give. Something's got to give, Tony. I don't think anything's going to give, Tony. We're fucked, okay? And we, as the government, municipal, provincial, whatever, you know, we can't really do much. We're having such a hard time getting funds for the essential programs, Tony. Theater and film or something else. They shouldn't be. I know, but they are. And that's the way it is, Tony. And if we don't get in the next time politically, you know, I may be out with, you know, no security, you know? And I'll be looking at the fucking home renovations and one, hey, 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 cowboy, everybody. You know what I mean, Tony? That was, that's what I'll be fucking doing, you know? You think you are to step it hard, Tony. You ought to try this. But we're proud of you, Tony, and keep us informed. I love what you're doing, Tony, and if I weren't doing this, Tony, I would be doing that, what you're doing. And so you hunt down one of those wealthy Italian businessmen. You take him to a lunch you can't afford. Tony, nobody fucking gave me a hand in this community. You know, I had to do it all by myself, you know. I put my own money in this and that and lost. Often, too often. But I always manage to get myself up. You know what I mean, Tony? I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a fucking robotic chair, Tony. I fall apart but pull myself together again. You know what I mean, Tony? I made lots of money in real estate when one really could make lots of fucking money, and I did. And I lived well, Tony, for many years. Still do. I was going to university out west, Tony. Fucking, I had 5,000 square foot pads screwing any chick I wanted, Tony. I had so much fucking pussy, you wouldn't believe it, Tony. It was a fucking good life, Tony. I swear to God. I had a fucking good time, Tony. I've been blessed. What can I tell you, Tony? And I sympathize with what you're doing, Tony. And there's more to do. You need me. You Call me, Tony. I wish I could put some money into your thing, Tony, but I have such a hard time putting money in my thing. You know what I mean? Get those fucking politicians off their asses, Tony! This country has no appreciation for culture, Tony. You want us to lose a fucking shirt to do anything. And if you die, some say, good. The other half says, oh, I wish I knew. You know, I would have known. You know, hey. 
Oh, Tony, we could have done something. You know what I mean? That's how it is, Tony. It really sucks. And that's why I have little respect for a lot of these fucking politicians. Don't get me wrong, Tony. There are some that are great. When you meet one, let me know, okay? I mean, I'm a right-wing conservative. I make no two bones about it, Tony. Give me a call. Let me know how I can help, okay? Hey, oh, 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 maybe next time, okay? I'm sorry. Keep me informed, okay? I'm really proud of you, Tony. I respect you. And if you knew me the way others knew me, you know I don't respect many people, Tony. Keep me informed, okay? Keep me informed. Getting the strong feeling that there might not be a community, you go see a community leader, the community leader. And there are hundreds of them, you know? Each one pointing to the other one as the leader among leaders, you know? Not him. Not him. And suddenly you realize where the mob gets its ideas. And you approach the one you've never approached before. You start fresh, no judgment, at least not from you, the community leader. And that's the story, Tony. I did it all by myself, even when everyone in the community told me it couldn't be done. You know, they'd rather see me dead, Tony, but thank God I'm still here, still trying to wake them up from their fucking coma, Tony. There is so much money, you have no idea, Tony, but giving it to the cultural events doesn't mean anything to them. You know, they have to have their picture in the frame or something. What's in it for me, they want to know. Dante Theater, they don't care, Tony. Community Center, they don't couldn't give a fuck, Tony. You know, they come to the odd picnic, eat a couple of sausages, come with their family, more for the grandmother than the grandfather, a smell of the old country. You know, they'll have a raffle, nobody ever wins, but somebody always wins, if you know what I mean. That's a community, Tony. You know, they come to me like I'm the community. You're the community! I tell them, Tony. All of you! I'm just a facilitator. A small artery. The big blood bypasses me and goes through some other artery. I'm not it! But together we can make the blood flow every which way. Within man is the soul of the whole, I tell them. And the whole of which you are the shining parts is the soul! But they don't get it, Tony. But you get it. So knock on every door. They're all connected and keep knocking on my Tony. I'll do my best. I can't give you money. That I know. But I can bring people to your letters. So that's what I'm good at, Tony. Rounding up people, you know what I mean? Together from this and that association and bring them down to your thing, your letters. That I can do. You know, maybe it's a talent I had from, you know, I got from my ancestors. You know, we used to round up sheep in the old country. I don't know, Tony. But I could do that, Tony. And if I could do more, I would. But my hands are tight, Tony. Every day I come to work, I expect to find out that they're closing me down. But what is a community without a community center, Tony? What's his life without education? These people have to be educated, Tony. They're Philistines. I mean, Philippines. Whatever. You know what I'm thinking, Tony. But who's going to fucking educate him, Tony? Not me. Me. Not you, it's the way it is, Tony. We're fucking screwed, we're not like the Jews, you understand me? Call me if you need me and I can see what I can fucking do. Okay, oh, 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 oh no, 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 come on. What about the Italian government, Tony? Yeah, you were born there. No, 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 no. You were born there, Tony, they owe you. No, no, they owe you. Don't take a no for the answer. No, no, they owe you, call me, okay? And then a long silence. And so you knock on the tricolor flag of Italy, the Italian government. Uh, uh, Tony, uh, your initiative is a sort of thing that we, that is consistent with the programs that we are trying to advance and promote within the Italian Canadian community. In reality, from an Italian government perspective, of course, but we can do only so much, Tony. Perhaps we can offer you a case of wine or something for one of your events, something like that, you know? We believe in sponsoring and promoting cultural endeavors that target the community they stem from and sprout of the community they target. And clearly, your event falls totally within this very clear objective and agenda. And your very impressive track record and reputation, Tony, small as it is, but noteworthy within a certain milieu and reality, only increase the chances of our support. You know, I cannot imagine our ministry in Italy, for instance, objecting to the case of wine in this instance. But we appreciate, Tony, however, if you don't mention the wine in your program. The ministry has a certain image and reputation to protect. Where sponsoring cultural events is concerned, a brief sponsored by would suffice. But we feel that the real responsibility, Tony, has to come from the community and its members, you know, specifically the community leaders and centers. In essence, the fulcrum, Tony, where important decisions are made in the name of community. There has to be a political will emanating from this community, not excluding the business people who have done very well for themselves. Thank you. At times to the political and financial advantages they have attained from this office, our government. And these people, Tony, should lead the agenda on the whole anthropological, ethnic, cultural themes. It's a touchy situation, Tony, for us, you know, no? and though I know that you were born in Italy, are Italian, carry a passport, but within this specific Canadian reality, however, Tony, or should I say Italian-Canadian reality, the mechanisms that would allow us to bring something like this to fruition are often complicated and complex. Not impossible, but given the complexity, perhaps they are difficult, in that they might not find a harmonious body to advance the whole discussion in a way that would be satisfactory and advantageous to all the parties involved. I'm sorry if this does not help, you know, you in any way, but I hope it outlines for you the very rather delicate dance, Tony, that exists, you know, within the community and how it becomes an ever-changing tune, you know what I mean, where new dance steps must be learned and invented to accommodate this ever-changing but ultimately fascinating tune, Tony, that perhaps you might want to draw from in the future and create from it something totally different, a new show or a letter. Perhaps we will look at such a project and see how we, the Italian government, of course, would find a home in it and at entry point for others as well. Keep us informed, Tony. It's very exciting, worth discussing at an intellectual, national, anthropological level, of course, but at a practical one too, you know, in order to find, discover something out of this mess, you know, that might crystallize into something we would and could be all proud to share with each other and others outside each other. Pills don't cure that kind of headache, you know? 
not willing to give in or give up, I tell him the truth. All right, I'm an agent. That's right, born and outfitted in Italy by a computer. I was six. Digitally reproduced to look like a starving Calabrian boy. I mean, that was easy in the Calabria of 1965, an economic boom year for northern Italy, apparently, but still medieval times for the south. While Rome and the world feasted on Dolce Vita and existential films, Calabria seasons its salad with lice and not by choice. And as Fellini flew west to festivals and meetings with moguls and the luxury of declining a pact with the devil Hollywood, Calabria had the devil sitting at its table and sleeping in its bed. A young boy in that Calabria just happened to die at the age of six. Don't know the reason, but it's Calabria. Hey, place with many reasons to die back then. The Italian government, well-versed on matters of malocchio, superstitions, and premature births in the South, snuck into the house of the Calabrian family where the dead six-year-old lay on the kitchen table, not quite smelling of death yet, but enough to attract the first wave of flies. The dead boy was taken away and my body put in his place. At the programmed hour, while the parents and sister wept by the table, I woke up and said hello to them like I'd known them my whole life. You know, I did. I was programmed with my, the entire history of the boy's life from hour one. The Calabrian family was ecstatic. A miracle, look, look, he resurrected from the dead like Christ, look. The whole town celebrated and called me by name. And I knew everyone by name too and was happy to know them. I was he, but he was dead. But to the parents and everyone else, I was he. To me, I was he. I could also speak the dialect. I had all his insecurities and fears. Suddenly I became as hungry as he had been, thanks to another program, and shared his dreams and passions. And ultimately, I made the trip to Canada with his parents, those I called mine, still do. My mission? to collect vital information on Italian Canadians, to see if three meals a day, a 6,000 square foot roof over their heads, a full-time job, a decent bank account, and education for their children had made a difference. The Italian government feared one day that they would have to explain to the world the mass exodus from Italy over the last century. The Italian government wasn't taking any chances. No, 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 no. It wanted to prove to the world, whenever the world would ask them to prove it, that immigrants were idiots to begin with in Italy before they became immigrants. That's why they got rid of them in the first place, idiot cleansing. And then when they became immigrants in the new land of choice, they remained idiots. The southern proverb, from nature to sepulcher, applied especially to idiots. If you were born an idiot, economic success can't cure you of it. It was a brilliant ad campaign, poised to be unleashed when the time came. I was just collecting the evidence, you know. Many young people like me were outfitted and shipped to other parts of the world, you know, Australia, Argentina, Belgium, Germany, and America, each with the same mission. It was actually a 40-year mission or study. I'm about to hand in my report to the Italian government in Italy, I said to the Italian government in Toronto, which will confirm their theory. But I can't complete it without funding! I know it's incomplete, I know it's limited, I know it's biased, I know it makes fun of those who like to make fun of others but not themselves. I know I treat the creme de la creme as if it were the cream of something else, but that's what I have to work with and that's what I'm working with. I mean, we're the best we can offer the world and this is the best I can do, sorry, I was programmed that way, not my fault. In fact, I can't even return to Italy to visit my real parents, the computer. Furthermore, the office that created me at Foreign Affairs in Rome no longer exists. People from the ministry in Rome, fed up with computers and desk jobs, took other jobs in countries they had never seen before, Costa Rica. On top of that, my parts are getting rusty and the programs are beginning to fail. Lack of funding, okay? But I was outfitted with a blackmail program as well, still functioning, a vital program to Italians, blackmail. I rarely use it, only with my parents, and I'm gonna expose the whole story unless the Italian government acknowledges me as one of its own. I was born there, goddammit! In two letters was the Italian government's idea from the beginning. And if I'm a Calabrian, it is because they programmed me that way, not my fault, not their fault. They followed what they thought was the standard for a Calabrian intelligence. This is it, me. So take responsibility and give me some funding so I can also share my 40-year findings with the people I have now fallen in love with. Yikes, Italian Canadians, yikes. I doubt I'll, I'll make it back to Italy in time before my hard drive crashes, so give me some fucking funding before I tell the whole world of uh, You know, when I realized I was talking to an answering machine that had cut me off long ago, I hung up. And realized once again that the best acting always happens when you're alone and there's no one watching. Distraught, thanks to a program that triggers depression, psychosis, and a bevy of psychological screw-ups, I called some people. And I commiserated with the journalist, and the journalist, you know, says, hey, Tony, I got so tired of it, I thought of committing suicide. And then, you know, then I got a cold, so I postponed the suicide. <laughs> you know, by the time the cold was over, it just didn't look right to kill myself right then and there, Tony. I mean, I survived the cold, it was the Norwalk virus or something like that. You know, I thought, hey, God, if I can survive this, maybe it's useless trying to kill myself. You know, I won't be able to kill myself. Maybe I'll survive that, too. So I'm just, you know, Tony, now I'm looking at the options, you know what I mean? I'm looking at the more attractive options. Suicide is still a strong possibility, Tony, you know? Because it might still benefit some people if I do that. So I'm not going to give that up, you know? I'm not somebody who gives up, okay, Tony? I might just do that. 
I don't give a piece, Tony. For now, I've distanced myself from the community. No one wants to set the bar too high for fear that you might be trying to obtain something they would be very uncomfortable with. So the bar is lower, Tony, where everyone feels more comfortable and at home, you know? And don't forget, Tony, then there's a Christmas bonus to remember. Bonus, let's call it a gesture. So they play it safe, and you still gotta pay your own fucking parking, Tony. But there is money, Tony, for sure. There's lots of money there, Tony. And so you consider another ethnic network, more ethnic than the other ones, apparently. The ethnic network. You know, so ethnic is a two-hour weekly special on the lost tribes of this and that, even the Sephardic Jews of Calabria. And therefore attracts more money and has a lot more power than all the other ones put together, apparently. And so I walk through the door with a clear objective, reminding them of the responsibility in the community they claim they serve, but forget to serve. But before you have a chance to play the guilt card, not forgetting to compliment them for doing the little they do, they preempt your strike. And you swear you've seen this scene in a movie before, maybe a hundred movies before. And the ethnic TV executive says, Tony, why didn't you come to us first? Ho! <laughs> oh, do you know how much money we have for that sort of thing here, Tony? Hey, whoa, 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 hey, do you have any idea? Do you want to see our books, Tony, and experience what it's like to have your jaw drop and lean on your fucking shoes, Tony? You know how much fucking money we have for that shit, Tony? If I said infinity, I'd have to times it by 10 at least, Tony. So do me a favor, Tony. Next time, see me first. Okay, fine, they help you, you know, that other network. Well, that's great, you know, but give us a fucking opportunity to help at least, Tony. Tony, that's all we ask. I mean, you got help from them, by all means, we don't want to interfere, but there's help and then there's help, Tony, okay? Well, that kind of help. You know, the kind of help that does a lot more walking than talking, okay? You talk to us, Tony, we'll walk for you. Three months later, same ethnic media executive. Sorry, Tony, they said no. I'm on your side, okay? No to lots of money, no to less money, no to a little money. Basically, no, Tony. It's a no all around. It doesn't even have the possibility to become a yes, Tony, down the line, okay? But I'm on your side, Tony, and we'll continue to support your project. Thank you for coming, Tony. Let's get together so I can see how we can help you with this, okay, Tony? Tony, you need a saint. They're around, okay? Just nail that appointment, okay? All right, so I called one. The saint. The saint. His secretary retook the call after I talked to him. She booked one immediately. I tell her I needed him yesterday, but I'm more than welcome an appointment today. So she books it for a month hence. I thank her like she had given me some cash, lots of it. She emails me the next day. She says, we need to change the appointment, Tony, for a week after the month. Okay, what am I gonna say? You know, are you crazy? I mean, who's asking who for what? Two days later, she emails me again. We need to change the appointment, Tony, for later that day, five weeks from now. Okay, but let me make sure I can cancel the one I had on that day for that time. It's for a physical, but hey, who needs a physical when I'm talking to saints, you know? <laughs> she emails me again before I had the chance to cancel the physical. Forget that day, Tony, she says. He can't, not in the old time, not in the new time, not even that month. And he's leaving the country the following day for about a month. How about late spring? Now, what about the first fall after fucking retirement? She emails me again. Haven't heard from you, Tony. How about late spring? And like a hangdog, you lick a thank you on your email. And so you try the universities, you know, those Italian Canadians, professors and students who strove beyond a Saturday night at the disco type life, you know, who rejected the SUVs, hair gel and spinning up and down Highway 7 at two in the morning to test how easy it is to die. I mean, perhaps hope lies there, you know, in the minds of tomorrow, they might care about today. And so you meet the professors, you know, they saw the letters, they understand. Oh, Tony, Tony, my God, my God, Tony, so good to see you. You are a Canadian treasure, Tony. That's my opinion, Tony. And I'm, and I'm not the only one, Tony. I told you this before, and I want to tell you again, Tony, the movie of yours. My God, Tony, how do I say what I've already said to you, Tony? There's too much to say, that's why, Tony. I don't want to offend you, Tony, but I never get tired of it, Tony, because I believe in you, Tony. I believe in all of it. I'm an optimist, Tony. Can I help it? When are you going to come back to the university and do something, Tony? My students keep asking me, and I have nothing to say to them, but let's hope. I want to die, Tony. You make me die, Tony. You know, I feel so much, I feel like dying, Tony. If I could die all over again each day, Tony, I would be a great dier. You know what I mean, Tony? I believe that because I believe in you I believe in everything Tony but most of all in you I know you got your letters going on for now that's fine go do your letters Tony but maybe after Tony will you at least consider it why do you make me beg Tony as far as the letters go I'll be out of town on those days <laughs> Tony can you believe it Tony I've never had to travel so fucking much in my life Tony it happens to fall precisely on those days Tony all 24 of them Tony can you imagine that and if you added another day Tony anyway I wouldn't be able to make that day too Tony it's like someone is conspiring to keep us apart Tony but I want to see you Tony I need you you know I got an idea about a conference Tony on what we're doing you know why we're not doing more of it you know how do we encourage more of it you know maybe invite you to speak at a conference so people can meet you bring a film if you want a clip anything Tony and we'll eat finger food and we'll talk and plan the future the one that is 
pushing out of her feet like a stream in the old country. Oh, fuel me, you know, before you have time to know where it's going. Where did it go? I don't know. I don't want that, Tony. I don't want that. I told you I'm an optimist, Tony. Will you consider this your home and not forget us? It's horrible to be forgotten, Tony. Remember, porta aperta, quasi spolancata for you, Tony, okay? And so you know I mean this, Tony. This, Tony, look. Look, Tony, just for you, a thought, un pensiero, a pen made of wood in a case made of wood. Wood! Canadian wood for a Canadian university, Tony. The case engraved with its name, and it's a proud one, Tony. The way I feel about you, Tony, proud. Could there be a better word? Of course there is, Tony. There always is. We go to school to search, find, and excavate those words, Tony. Bring them out of retirement to express what is difficult to express, what has been beautifully expressed so many times before by those poets we hold so dear to our hearts. Let's not compete with those poets, Tony. Let's love them for what they gave us and leave them alone. We can't touch them. They were giants confronted with the same words. They just arranged them in a better way. That's all, Tony. But I dare to arrange them this way for you, Tony, to express all of this and more to you. This pen, Tony, from velut arbor ebu to you, Tony. I feel sick. I'm using Latin. I'm sorry, Tony. But if not me, Tony, who? Take this pen, Tony, as a tree through the ages to you, Tony. This is my life, my body and soul all in one. Take this number two, Tony, and call it. It's a 905 and the seven digits and the 416 if you can't get me at the 905, Tony. But you'll get me some Somewhere, Tony. We're meant to get all we can get from each other, Tony. And I'll give you a 613 as well, so you can find me anywhere, Tony, night and day. The seven digits never change. I never change, Tony. I am now who I was at the beginning of this conversation, Tony. Can I help it? It's my upbringing, and it was a good one, Tony. Keep these numbers, Tony. Do your lifeline to me and mine to you. Commit them to memory and throw away the key, Tony. Is it possible I can't say anything without sounding like a character in a movie, Tony? Don't I deserve better? Haven't I earned that at least, Tony? Not from anyone, but from me. Don't I owe me better, Tony? Should I give myself that at least? Must I be a living Salieri to a dead Mozart? Could God not have thrown me a better bone? Reverse the order. You know, he's God. If anyone can do it, Tony, he could, but he didn't. He gave the world this. Me, in carne e ossa. Me, scraps of material for a mocking cachina. But we came to this country, Tony. No one forced us. And the mocking cachinas will have the last word, Tony. It is not written, but I'm saying it as if it were written in this coupon, Tony. Also for you, gourmet away, on us, go eat, go eat, Tony, on us, go wherever you can eat, all you can eat, eat fat like a pig, Tony, no porcellino, with rosy cheeks, okay, bones can sustain ideas, Tony, look at you, you're so skinny, Tony, opera needs fat, so do you, Tony, and then come to see us through the double doors, Tony, that fat, I want to see you, okay, I wish I could join you, I can't join you, I can't, sorry, that too is our destiny, never to dine together, Tony, I can't take it, it kills me, you know, Tony, you know, I area code from one place to another, every second of my life, from this to that, it feels like I'm never where I'm scheduled to be, but it took me a long time to learn to live the moment I wasn't scheduled for, Tony, don't hold those missing moments against me, Tony. It's the worst time of the year to see your letters, Tony. For me, the students, maybe the world, you know. It's a timing thing. March that breaks in two, and then you have the horrible backstretch with exams and papers. Is it human, Tony? Ask me, is it human? When are these standardized tests going to stop so we can enjoy your two letters, even everyone else? Everyone's two letters, or three letters, if that's what they want to do. What am I? We're puppets, Tony. Is it fun? It never was. I'm a chair of the department, but I don't sit, Tony. I stand on that chair, Tony. And so I can see far and wide. And so people can see me back, Tony. And I want to see you back, Tony. I'm sorry if I'm not brief, Tony. The occasion calls for length and depth, you know, from up and down, right to left, Tony. I will do whatever I can to promote your work. I've already emailed massively half the world, not only the Italian, but the German, the French, Department spreading the word about your two cursed bloody letters, Tony. Cursed, because that's what they are, Tony. They're abandoned, left alone of interest to no one, Tony. Oh my God, I can't believe I said that, Tony, but I'm honest, you know. I'm learning from you, Tony. Will you give me that at least? You know, they're rotting for lack of nutrition, those letters. Who am I to judge them, Tony? I don't even know them, but isolation can't be good, even for them, Tony. They're ossified, and you might go with them. I don't want that, Tony. I want you here, Tony. And I know the two or three of my students, Tony, have left, and they've been downtown to see those letters with two other people who fell asleep, Tony. <laughs> Tony, they fell asleep, Tony. Can we blame them if they fell asleep at your letters, Tony? If your letters put them to sleep, can we actually blame them if it's a sleepy audience? Do we have no one to wake them up, Tony? Answer the question as if you had asked it, Tony. That's always the best answer. Could we do more? Is that a question? Of course, always more, never enough. We build with questions, Tony. We die with answers. Don't look at me that way, Tony. Don't mock me. It's too easy. Do what's harder. Look the other way, Tony. Go, go, give him hell, Tony. And then come back and give us hell, Tony. Through the double doors, Tony. That fat we want you, Tony. That's how much love awaits you right here, Tony. It'll kill me to wait, but you're killing me now, Tony. You're killing me. Why do you make me suffer, Tony? Why do you make me suffer? Go. A few minutes, please.
And there's a real fear that knocking on doors, any door, especially on too many and too many times, implies lack of quality in the work, your work. But the work has no quality. An all-consuming nightmare for any artist, living or dead. I mean, if the work is any good, if it does have quality, people should be knocking on your door. And you would have an executive assistant to deal with a throng, but you don't. After all, you go looking for Dechecko and Barilla. They don't come looking for you. And you complain when a store doesn't carry them and threaten to boycott the store if they don't. Barilla and Dechecko are that good and that confident. And where are you? Knocking on fucking doors. You make me sick, you tell yourself. So with a tiny knowledge that a discussion on meat in a room full of vegetarians is futile, even if it's good meat, you reassemble your spirits and you bank on your tiny knowledge instead of your big fear and you tell yourself more doors to knock on and knock down if necessary. Soon enough, they get used to your knocking, even those you have yet to knock on. You know, they got you figured out, pegged like some Jehovah Witness or Avon calling. They can smell you from another time zone to shame even a bloodhound. Like peasants in small Calabrian towns that shut windows in your face before your face even shows up. They go silent or disappear like your death at the door. They preempt your strike the way you used to theirs. They know how to play you better than how you used to play you and remind you once again where the best acting is, that acting schools are definitely a waste of time and that all the world's a stage wasn't a stretch for Shakespeare. If you're paying attention, he was. They make you believe they believe in what you believe and that they believe you when you say you're looking for engagement, not handouts. They're that good. Even a Stanislavski would not be able to spot a method in their acting. An Olivier or a Brando is an amateur to these pros. Proof, they never won an award because no one ever caught them acting. I mean, you have to be able to spot the acting in order to call it acting and then give it a bone, an Etrog, or an Ellie. These are the people who inspired Shakespeare, not the actors he hung around with, the ones who can, we can still find in bookstores looking for the recipe. These are the people you give awards to. They're the most believable, along with the bank robber, rapist, murder, and brain surgeon. Because they're in the moment, the way actors will never be. I mean, we need clues to know who's acting and who isn't, and our actors supply us with too many. The great actors don't give you any clues, and they don't work in theater, film, or TV. Not interested. All the world is a stage to them, and they've got that world on a string. They act the first six ages of man and leave you with the last scene of all, oblivion, saw teeth, saw eyes, saw taste, saw everything, whether you like it or not. It's hard not to take things personally, you know, though you preach not to take things personally. But there's no conspiracy here. The world is not that organized, neither is God. You scan the book of Job looking for humor. My too many sins disqualify me from his wisdom, comfort, and hope. God tag teaming with the fucking devil to try to, to try your patience is one hell of a fucking way to spend his heavenly time. You realize Job was not Calabrian, but that his wife may have been. And Calabrians still curse a God that never sprouted from their ground or their hearts, but was shoved down their throat and still stuck there. Pay attention to the world, not to God, goes the proverb. This DNA, you know, a huge mine of cultures, of mountains, Roman and Greek, of seas lapping its land with Byzantine, Norman and Spanish and Arabs and Berbers and gypsies, French and Indo-Europeans and countless Trojan horses. This original multi-ethnic Italy to shame any two founding nations. And now this, even when still and only your mind moving, you're with time, in space and out of sync with both like shopping out of season or after hours for essentials. You're dead unto the living world and living with the dead, a limp skin on a Sistine wall, but judged by no one in particular and the climate in general. And so you're down to the last door. You knock on your own, not from inside a coffin, though the image fits, like the Earl of Gloucester with no eyes and a terrible judge of character having overestimated your own. You put your hand into your own account and reach down all the way down to the lowest part of your RSPs, your foundation, your retirement. You empty it out bit by bit and you spend it on your two cursed letters. Fuck Freedom 55. You know too many actors who are over 55 still working and not free. Who too many times did exactly what you're doing now, taking care of your present and making your future less of a future. Besides, my godfather has saved a bundle, you know, poised to spend it, enjoy it all in life at the dawn of 65. The night before, he fell from his roof, head first to the ground, several months in a coma, alive today, but just not the same as he was yesterday, when he worked eight-hour shifts, three shifts in a row, numb to the bone, when he was freer 
definitely more free when he was working towards it. You do all the right things to withdraw your money and you kiss goodbye that fat document you relied on to renew a mortgage. The word death in the word mortgage hits you for the first time. And you hit your fraternal benefit society like a thief at a border crossing. Not that you're one, but that's how those looking at you look at you. You figure out the peak time and you try to avoid that. You want this robbery to be smooth, uneventful, you know, with few witnesses in and out. And how you wish you could fucking wear a stocking over your head for this one time to retrieve your own fucking money like you were begging for it. The receptionist greets you with, you know, like you walked into the wrong building. She's new, that's okay, you know. The 12 before her over the last year were also new. You know, the job doesn't pay well, but the stationery sparkles. And you're paying for it. I mean, you know the routine. You produce your ID, waiting for her to write the speeding ticket. She stares at the picture way too long, wanting to make sure you didn't steal the face you walked in with. That you're not one of those pretending to be a starving actor, withdrawing his RSPs for the hundredth time. There's no one there, so, you know, you wanted to hurry before somebody else gets there and sees you. Before you have the chance to think that thought, there's a Great Depression lineup right behind you. Like those of archival footage, you know, in soup kitchens. The tattered clothes, patched elbows, and shriveled stomachs all in their face. Actors, just like you, pretending they're there to review their insurance benefits. Taking quick trips to the landline, you know, to the phone, you know, to check up on the last gig promised two years ago. Any news, by the way? They're on a roll, they say, you know, their last gigging shortly after the last ice age. Everyone does everything but relate, hoping no name will be called out loud, especially their own, when the handouts, their own money, are handed out. And you're one of them at the head of the line. That, plus the eight by tens on the wall, actors, black and whites, sepia by time, ossified to the fucking wall, gives you the picture those outside can't see, the one you're refusing to see in that very moment about yourself and our culture. You thank the new receptionist, you welcome her to the job, and stare at the envelope to avoid the stare of those who are actually doing what you're doing, making little of what's inside the envelope. In your car, you play out fully your delayed reaction. You stare at the fucking amount. Why so much tax on so little? Will this carry you through till people come charging through those distillery gates to see two letters? No, it's not enough. It's not fu Yes, I'm leaving, you tell the guy. Yeah, you can have the car spot, no problem. And you crawl all the way to the actor's fund like a cat run over by a car, using only your front paws, begging your picture on the brochure, telling those who don't have that they have somewhere to go when they have nowhere to go for food, utilities, and shelter. And the PR ghost, now also a producer, an assistant to her own self, sitting in her high-rise hell, up to the armpit in her own account, making sure she doesn't have the money she didn't have a month ago. She scrapes the bottom of the barrel like a spoon to an empty peanut jar like Uncle Billy looking for lost money in It's a Wonderful, Pathetic Life. Her other hand, busy emailing the world, an average of 100 a day, using words to describe two letters that frankly embarrass me and will probably embarrass my child for generations to come. But she believes those words, and that touches me, and I feel blessed. But worry about her health and her sanity, and what was she thinking when you asked her to think about thinking of embarking on this journey once more? Well, too late. The fact you warned her doesn't make you feel any better. Besides, you know, strength isn't the people you tell yourself. Numbers, those who will rush to see two letters, those who can't get in because too many got in before them, those who don't even care what it's about, they just want in. And just maybe, Tony, two letters were slapped together like cheap butter to Catelli penne, and the joke's on you. And here's another joke. You walk into a restaurant and come face to face with a trio who do what you do, theater. They open in two days, so nerves are understandable. One of them, an actor, usually too giddy and happy on account of your presence, usually not this time, he stares at you, like you're pointing a 12 gauge to his face, you know, and he's looking down the barrel, frozen, afraid to cough and activate the trigger, like he was convinced you were still in prison for murder and didn't hear about your release, that you would be released ever. The other one, I don't know and I don't care to know, you know, he smells like one who takes his cue from the others, from these two for now, doomed, an actor. I think I'll wait to see that performance. I think I've seen it. The third is a director, one I've known for not too long, or 25 years. One who every time we meet acts like he's in a foreign country, so it makes you feel like you're in a foreign country, as a defense thing, you know? The three stooges are sitting in an awkward silence, wondering why I'm not doing what I normally do, break that silence. No, not this time. I want to get to know this silence, because it's got the look of something I'll be seeing a lot more of, I'm sure. I mean, it would be presumptuous to think that they've read half the dozen articles that came out on Two Letters in the fall, but I know they know people I know who have read those articles, including the one who said to me that Posner's story made him think, for a second, we weren't in Toronto, as in, thank God. But you're stuck with trying to come up with good reason for the long silence when we could have been exchanging, hey, how's your family, the kids? How old? How old are they? Oh, my God, and yours? All that, but no, none of that. 
So you resist doing what comes naturally to you, filling in the pause with your confused and all over the place humanity. And then you break the ice you didn't know you'd find. And you say, hey, what are you guys doing here? Um, we preview tonight. How are you doing? One says. I said, oh, you know. Doing this and that, you know. Uh-huh. More silence. And then I take a seat with my back to them so I don't have to look at their backs. Suddenly their table comes alive. Now, you know, they're chit-chatting and interrupting each other all over the place with stories and whatnot. <laughs> Laughing, you know, exciting, excitement about this and that. And I got a sick devil smile on my face, you know, knowing the devil is sitting at their table, not mine. And so I get into my work. Focus, I said, Tony, you got a letter tonight. Focus! When it's time to pay the bill, I stand, I look back with a goodbye smile. They're gone. And I was sitting so close to the door, I checked my back, no knives, thank God, no bleeding, fuck. My God, of course, you know, that silence. That was the knife, not against me, at themselves. A tool carved by their own fear. But I plug along like some poor immigrant fuck shoveling gravel into a carriola or snow or belting a child with a buckle. It was all done with the same passion and commitment, no discrimination, you gotta respect that at least. My God, I'm as stubborn with this writing thing as they were doing their thing, you know, that old generation. And you know that no matter how hard they worked, it produced very little. Tired muscles, shattered bodies, and little else. A lot of pain, but did it for their kids, all of it. You gotta respect that too. And at least they worked outdoors. And you know how that is. How good it feels, that old-fashioned feeling you feel in your body, in your lungs, especially in winter, and feel you've earned that beer and love drinking it, even if you prefer wine. But it's harder to feel things in your body when you're sitting on your ass trying to use your heart and brain, numbed by too much pain. It's only two days I've re-delved into these letters and my brain is killing me, hoping something jumps out at me, hopefully the shit, the enemy in the writing. The truth is it all feels like shit, and so you edit. Like an SS officer with baton in hand, you choose who goes to the left, who goes to the ovens, and hope the words you didn't kill can slave for you. There's cruelty in that. And what about the presentations at Art, Co Art Core Gallery, Tony, where the moderator each night threatens to outnumber the audience, you know? My God, it's like we were doing it on purpose, afraid to peak too soon. I mean, why don't they fucking burn down the gallery, you know, those no-shows? Why don't they come and voice their fucking anger, who they're angry at and why? It's not like I sprayed lamb's blood all over the gallery door to keep them away so they could skip over the letters and not kill them. They're welcome to kill them with their presence, not their silence. That's killing me. And why did that theater soloist guy who came twice think the two letters is about making him feel guilty for being Canadian? English Canadian is what he meant by Canadian, but he never took in the irony. It took a Yaakov with a lifetime of knowledge and a symphony of pain to supplant that fear-based emotional mongrel not with stones or answers, but with questions shooting out of Plato's cave and by putting up a mirror to that self-made victim whose truth is nothing but shadows. But at least that self-inflicted wounded Canadian came twice and debated, angry as he was. You know, ping pong balls, that's why people can't come to the letter, you know? Or the theater, you know, they're too busy pricing and shopping for fucking ping pong balls and tables for a friend's birthday. 50 emails a day and counting from people I don't know, I don't want to know, not that way. So I replied all, enough ping pong balls, you're busting mine. Please take me off the reply all list unless you want me to show your fucking email account with ping pong balls, viruses for the rest of your fucking lives. I mean, where do people get so much time in a time when they say they don't have time, you know, to dedicate to ping pong balls? Keep your balls. Keep your math and your sex jokes. Be in or be out. Send your checks or don't. Go to the fucking birthday party or don't. And get on with your lives! But most of all, take me off the reply all list. You know, and they sign off with their stupid names like Suz, Fur, Sin, Sam, Poo, Stu, Tum. You know, you, kn you know they're on the job, you know? Their spelling in the email tells you that. And you fear, your worst fear may be true. They may be running the country for all you know. And suddenly actors, even the dummies who crowd two letters, look like geniuses and thinkers, and apologies may be in order. You know, one email in particular grabs your attention, and it's not about balls, it's about your two letters, and it's from a writer, a guy who writes the way you think one should. Give up the letters, Tony, publish them, they're unperformable, and, well, you got the picture. Send me the text and I'll try to hack them to death. The deal is this, Tony, you don't have to pay the slightest attention to what I say. Okay, that I like. I actually like his provocation, because I like him. But like the stubborn Calabrian that I am, I tell him, go ahead, hack them to death on paper while I try to keep them alive on stage. I get another email by one who apparently always sees the big picture, but the letter he saw was a small picture, too small, too specific, relates only to theater people, you know, and leaves those not in the theater out. Essentially, Tony, it's a performance piece, you know, that's about it. 
And that's what you do. It's all you got. You hit art court gallery four times a week, a place looking more and more like the inside of your tomb. You look for the sole moderator. You thank him or her, assuring him or her there will be at least one person to debate with me. And if the co-producers don't abandon ship three, you hang out in the laneway in front of the gallery, mulling over kidnapping a half dozen people on their way to Soul Pepper Theater. Nothing personal. They're friends. Last time we met, I'm sure they'd want to help. You know, they seem to be doing pretty good. I can get by with a little help from them. They're young at heart. They're team players. They live by that Christian spirit and Christmas carol thing. They know what it's like for a Scrooge to eat alone at Christmas. I'm far from Scrooge. Don't live in a counting house. And I certainly haven't devoted my life to the accumulation of wealth. They know that firsthand, good God. I'm more like Cratchit, you know? Stationed in the poorly heated tank, the gallery, for lack of bodies, not heat, and not much to count, night after night. And what about Tiny Tim, Tony? Fucking Tiny Tim, you know? Are we gonna put him on stage in December and forget about him for the rest of the year? Isn't he the possible early death of the child creation in all of us, the victim of our collective human stinginess, the one we kill limb by limb if we don't do something to alter his fate? Stop it, Tony. Take advice from your four-year-old prophet who wisely uses his inner remote to fast forward Blue Meanie's attack at night in his dreams. And don't forget, Tony, the enemy always starts with mirror, mirror on the wall. Oh, Dickens, you know, London had advantages. It burned to the ground a few times. 1666, that long distance number to the devil. Number one followed by three sixes and dialed by the careless baker, the king's baker, no less. And then the great plague, the black death, the great stink, typhoid fever, cholera scourging Victorian London. And if a good went on for too long, actors would go on stage and pray for a bad, as I do now, like a Prospero calls a tempest. You know, disasters are character forming. Where to be or not to be is daily bread. Oh, dear Hamlet, you know, even those who wear you for a lifetime, who dream of you, speak of you, and through you, speak of their little worlds and not of their times. Times always hard, always bloody, always betrayal. That's why they're irrelevant and you're not. But they act their ass off, eager for glory and Dora's. And you wait, buried in the dust. No generation will ever clear, Hamlet. And what a selfish bastard you are, Hamlet. You're like Satan working for God, and we cheer for you. So much suffering and death around you, Hamlet, because of you, even your own. If your fatherland were twin towers, a Muslim Claudius had taken down, you would shock and awe, and we would awe and shock. It's not revenge or murder we hate, no, no, but those who can't express it and their pain so beautifully. You're the prince of victims, Hamlet, with perfect language and exquisite poetry, which is why we don't forget you, forever quote you, but have yet to know you because we don't know ourselves. What a piece of work is man indeed, that it should come to this, you know? This above all, to thine own self be true. What fucking bullshit. So let me be cruel, not unnatural. I will speak daggers to all, but use none. And with a little patience and a climate change, heat waves, floods, exposed sewers, droughts, mosquitoes, and smog skies of asthma and strokes, and with any fucking luck, Toronto has a chance to be or not to be. And while I'm in to be or not to be. Just outside the gallery door, I'm in Dickens' London of 1840s during one of its waves of contagious disease. It's not the cobblestones, but the guy walking on them towards me, actually. It's not raining, and the sunlight is still trying to hang on for a few more minutes, knowing most wars are waged at night when no one sees. But the moment feels wet and dark, a London dark, not even a, a gaslight for a square inch of clarity, perfect night for a ripper and the temperature go goes way down, but up. And like Juliet, a faint cold fear thrills and cuts through my veins that almost freezes up the heat of life. And I, it's, it's an actor, and I know him. So far, so good. You know what, he's got a thing in his walk, like he's gonna fuck or kill the first person he face to faces. It's got that kind of purpose in it. I'm not on his path, and I know him, so I'm not worried, though his walk keeps telling you to reconsider. And the fact that he's walking, hugging the opposite wall is something else to consider. It's out of character. I mean, this guy defines hyper jolly. Manic happy is his name. The guy who constantly violates the minimum eight inch aura circumference in your face. You know, the tiny bit of distance that should separate two people unless you're necking, threatening, or giving mouth to mouth. He's in your face, usually. A close up too close to read. It's a thing he does, so you can't read. But on this day, he lives in a wide shot on purpose and for your eyes only. And no hyper, no jolly, no manic, no happy, just that thing in his walk that's now in his face. 
Just about now, you want Mozart's Lacrimosa, the symphony. It goes with all of this. A cloak in slow motion, you know, death doing his rounds with perfect peripheral vision, 360 eyes you can't see. I mean, he must have watched a lot of movies, I tell myself. He walks like a film credit with no hurry to exit frame. Like a film character, you know, tolerating the downpour way too much, the way only a romantic lead would and could. And while in that frame, he says, Hey, Tony. I said, hey, you got a show tonight? Yeah. And he turns his head and exits frame, but still in character. The top of his hat collecting enough rain to fill a bathtub all the way down the alley till he gets to the young center where I'm expecting him to park his horse, you know? He never looks back. A back with more aggression than the front of any beast aimed at you. Wow, with that kind of support, that kind of fraternal love, you hit the stage. Stage, a computer sitting on a milk crate, sitting on a high chair, each holding onto the other with duct tape by red green, and all of it draped in black, and you standing behind it. The fuck are you waiting for, Tony? Five more minutes of this to see who shows up and who doesn't, only threatens to empty the place of the handful that came, sitting patiently, long enough to take in the art and ask themselves way too many times, hey, this is it, two more hours of this? And before you open your mouth, an audience member opens theirs first. Hey, my best friend said this is one of the best things she's seen. Well, 20 feet is too far to smell the liquor, but her attitude and body language, special enough for the naked eye to see from Mars. You tell her to put that thought right back where she found it and leave it there and wait till the end to see if she'd have another thought to offer. Well, she doesn't wait till the end and snores like 12 donkeys braying. The ease and liberty and confidence of her snoring reflect the quality of your work and remind you, you are the sleep clinic now, Tony. You wrote this one, not Goldoni. No, 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 no. And no director can be blamed for it, Tony, but you, only you. She leaves, thank God, before the other two, the only two, have time to kill her. Though they're thinking it, you know? And you can feel they're thinking. I mean, you're thinking it, but you're hoping those two will do it for you. You know, but they haven't planned to kill anyone. You know, they just came for one of the two letters to witness how they kill me. No, no, they'll bet on the quality of her snoring, knowing she'll choke on it one day, if not this day. You know, besides the 20 minutes she was there for, offered the evening the best comedy or drama, depending how you look at it, you know? Those other two, oh, they belong to some acting school, the kind that doesn't fuck around, okay? Where you learn the skills necessary to pursue a career in film, theater, and commercials. Where they ask, hey, are you ready to change your life? And if you're not, stay home. Well, they welcome your authentic self because apparently it's also looking for you. Though it, it thought it might find you there at the acting school and that's where it stayed and they have it and you're more than welcome to meet your authentic self, have a drink with him, take him out for lunch or supper, just sign up for the two day intensive training because the adventure continues and will continue. You know, that school, by the way, was poised to send an army of students to the letters, read about the letters online, but they'll send two for now and let's see where it goes and how it goes, okay? The two are moved by letter one and can't wait for letter two. They show up for letter two, but there is no letter two because there is no people, only two, you two. Again, come back, we will, good, they don't. A call comes through. The two who saw one, letter one, on second thought feel they were wrong about their first thought. Hey, is an acting based on first thoughts? But why get technical? As a result, no more announcement on their electronic bulletin, nor will they encourage Toronto-based students to attend further readings. Why? Asked the PR ghost. The computer, the what? Well, you know, Tony stands and reads from a computer. He doesn't connect with the audience, so much so that some people actually fell asleep. I mean, didn't, you know, they didn't make it for the second half. I mean, you want to bring up drunk, but I've taken enough acting lessons to not want to hear, okay, you're being defensive, Tony. Okay, just listen, take it in, take it in. And so you take it in, because they specialize in giving it. Well, it's just not a good show, they say. It's not for us. What can we say, they say. And they offer more. We think it'd be a great idea for Tony to take some acting classes with our teacher in L.A. Because he's such a phenomenal teacher. I mean, what Tony's doing, what he's done, looks great on paper. But the show doesn't hold up. Our teachers and coaches are the very best. That's what we're offering Tony. The very best. I mean, I don't like red meat, but there are times when my body wants it, needs it, and will go anywhere to get it. Needs to see the red in the meat and feel the right amount of texture in my teeth. Filet mignon, you know, dainty and powerful, the very best. That's respect for your body. Same with wine. Whoever said that wine creates art is wrong and right. It relaxes the muscles around the thought. And my thoughts need more time. I mean, why does literature, fuck literature, we, why do we spend so much time on betrayal and I mumble my upside down thoughts, forced to speak with my feet, kicking, choking, thinking of Judas with a fucking box seat in hell. Head first, central mouth, the two Romans have it easy, but Judas, God, I feel his pain. 
as Dante tit for tats on God's behalf and skins his fucking back with Lucifer's claws. You fucking Dante! You know as well as I do, you have to think it to write it. But what writing, Dante, you'd think hell wrote hell. So you strike the set, you put up for a couple of people in a drunk set, three curtains we call blacks, and you hit the laneway once more, and somebody's there to meet you, cigarette in his mouth and a grin on his face, a poodle, a stray. He walks by and walks away. I mean, he would have stopped and barked at Richard the fucking third, okay? But he chooses to ignore me on his way to hell. Machiavelli was right again. Without power, not even a dog, poodle, will bark in your face. Come here, dog, come here, dog. Tony, huh? It's the prince. The jefe from the Young Center, just checking in. You know, he must have heard how well we were doing. Why else would he be here? You know, I feel like Robert Refford meeting Deep Throat by accident, if there is such a thing. Hey, Tony, uh, yeah? Uh, wait, wait, what's wrong with your company member, I asked. Oh, yeah, that? Oh, well, you know, I thought, you know, he thought you were criticizing our production of Goldonian Letter too. Read it in the press or something. But I assured him it was the other Goldoni you were on about. You know, that you are a friend, Tony, not a foe, you know? What is it, our production you were criticizing? Look, I don't have the time to write Letter 3. I'm having a hell of a time with the two I'm doing now, okay? Though your, 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 you know, your Purple Rose of Cairo, Indiana Jones guy is making a good case for it. You know, I got one on funding in here, you know, right here. Maybe I'll put this into that. Well, we now have to watch what we say to our friends, eh? Well, was there ever a time we shouldn't? Hey, Tony, come on, why don't you come for a drink? It's closing night. What are you closing? Oh, the one we opened six weeks ago. And in a silence, we said more, but mainly in my head, as I imagined our best chat to date. I said, I don't go to the theater. Well, I heard, Tony. No, no, don't take it personally. It's me, you know, I'm filthy, and I haven't graduated to clean. My first trip to Toronto from Montreal by train, Union Station, an immigrant from I don't know where, had been walking around for hours in Toronto, carrying around an, a finished cigarette in his hand. He didn't know what to do with it, you know, where to throw it. Not one cigarette, but on the sidewalk or street. So clean, he said. Well, 25 years later, Toronto still doesn't like to get dirty. Oh, Tony, the rant begins from the Almighty Father to the Son. That's a handy Calabrian proverb. Go take a shit and pound it with your fist. Chuckles the clown, a Sheminite, a whorish actor who does very well for himself between long periods of not doing very well, said the same thing to me and the, at the Cleaver Ghost. He didn't have the guts to say to my face. When he walked out of here, incensed at letter one, his face has been spotted around town recently, a Polaroid of despair running away from my mouth, fearing it may be Lucy's first fourth. And so he treadmills away, even in his sleep. And no one can say he didn't earn his hell personally. You know, I prefer a Count Ugolino fate for him, cannibalizing his dead kin in the Tower of Hunger, or frozen in the ice, chewing and gnawing on the skull of his betrayer. I don't know which is worse. Oh my God, Tony, is this what you want? I mean, where's your love for the guy, your compassion for humanity? Oh, it's fucking there. You know, but the, beyond the horizon of his hatred for himself. I mean, that's who you should fucking fear. How oh, we constantly confuse those who run with those who see astounds me. We owe it to what we do to know the difference. We owe it to Leonardo to know that Machiavelli was his friend, not our enemy. There was a spotless mirror. Well, clean mirrors are hard to find, Tony. Oh, no, no. You haven't been to an Italian household. I mean, so clean those mirrors, they reflect a whole new dimension. You know, as kids, we wouldn't dare stare into them in the dark unless you wanted to meet the devil and watch a demo of your death. Mm. To test the superstition, my sister and I would take turns locked in the pitch dark back room, flashlight in hand. Well, Tony, even Puff the Mighty Dragon could not be brave without a powerful friend. Well, friend, you know, powerful friends, many around when you don't need them, on vacation when you do. Well, how many friends did you make over the last year, Tony? Well, I was apparently working in the other direction, didn't even know it, you know, house cleaning. You know, I did so well, my closest, fearing he may be my only friend, tried to kill himself. Well, judgment has its price, Tony. No, I try to say what people do, not what they ought to do. The first gets you killed even 500 years after your death if you do it well enough. The other makes you irrelevant now and forever. You know, I'm just not very good at the first and fall too often into the ought. My limitations come from not being able to see all of what people do. But the ought is usually clear when you look at what is. People don't need me to tell them that. Well, then stop telling them, Tony. Maybe your letters are meant for the reader, not the stage. Well, apparently many agree with you. Well, because people want options, Tony. That's what they want. They don't, you don't offer any. Well, what do you like? Well, I don't really work that way, Tony. I'm more focused on people than myself, and I know what people want, and I'm willing to work hard to give it to them. Well, what do I want? Well, you're not people, Tony, not in that way. What way? Well, wait, I mean people. You know, you're like me. You're different. Well, what if people think we're people? Yeah, well, but we are, Tony. To them, we should be a different kind of people. I mean, to them, we're the people who know what people want. But you have to have a product, you know, a plan, 
Oh, you mean before the people? No, to offer the people, Tony. They want choices. I see that we offer and create knowing what they want before we actually know. Well, we're good at guessing, Tony, which is why we can say we know what people want. And they know we understand things better than they do. Oh, I see, experts. No, Tony, specialists. You know, you're using a lot of we now. I don't know what people want. Well, that's honest, Tony. And you're right, but you're wrong. You do know, you know someone who does. Ah, uh, you? Well, it might as well be you, because you knew it was me. Me, that is I, Tony, is the right answer. Me is we. And if you had any doubt about that, we wouldn't be doing this. So you know, Tony, how could you not know and invite me here? Invite you? I'm answering your prayer, Tony. And you know I can answer it. And knowing that, I become your we. There's power in that, Tony. Though you personally don't know or see or can't guess what people want, but I can. I mean, people are paying for their lives with their lives. They're drowning in what is. They want to see what can be, Tony. They want to see stars. That's why we call them stars. They bring light, glow, and smiles like real stars. You know, you ever hear of a murderer talking about the stars when talking about murder? No, because they don't go together, Tony. Certainly not on stage. Even a horror has a silver lining. True talent, Tony, is an appearance. The sheer brilliance of what seems, supported only by the evidence of talent and nothing else. Beauty and dreams on runways with sexy swerves, fast guts, and color, Tony. We lead, Tony, by serving. Well, should our community not be served? Does it not qualify as a community? I mean, should it not be scrutinized, studied, and exposed like any other? Why are we not fucking debating politics of our theater with theater on stage? What is fucking wrong with taking the theater community to task? Where do we find the fucking Aristophanes and Senecas of our age? Where is that list? No, no, Tony, you don't want a list. You'd have nothing to do. And it goes against your point. The poet who stands alone is the only true poet, according to you and your Greek friend. No, give it, well, given our city poet in Toronto, our Monsignor, who frequently sheds his clerical collar but not his views, you may have a point there. Our city fucking poet, a great office with a powerful pen, popular with many, and the mayor and his staff and a talent with no purpose but great flexibility, like a dog licking its balls. At least with the dog, you know his balls are clean. And he does have a knack for admiring the reflection of his own ego, our city poet. He patronizes the present and crucifies the fucking past. God, what courage, you know? So the sun is not the center of the universe, as Galileo thought, for there are many suns, as we know today. And for that, Galileo should have been shot, says our illustrious city poet. But Galileo didn't fucking give a fuck about the sun, though he did. He was an astronomer. He didn't care whether the world was round or flat, though he did, because he was curious and a scientist and a physicist. And when he said, e pur si muove, he was only defending a right to an opinion contrary to that of those who didn't think he had a right to one. It takes giant testicles to put the past on trial and excuse the present. It takes guts to ask people to watch you lick your own balls like our city poet. Let's see in 500 years from now what history has to say about our city poet. My God, our city poet, custodian of truth for sale and a jack of poets who keeps telling us you can't handle the truth. Like our theater community that patronizes patrons, ignores a fire in the basement, while preaching to the world that we're world-class theater. You know, we've gone full circle and have become those we used to resent. Well, I don't mean to interrupt your pre-show warm-up, Tony, you know, assuming you'll have one tonight, uh, but you're wheeling and dealing in the personal, the small world, and mainly in your mind. I, too, am part of that world, Tony, but I don't go, you know, I, I don't work in or with. I work it and understand it. And there are certain privileges and discretions allowed to those in the small world who work for the larger cause, Tony. It comes with the territory, the perks, and people like their perks, Tony, in every field. If you want harmony, you have to allow for that. People would rather see the premature death of a parent or a firstborn than miss out on a chance in the spotlight, Tony. Even those watching those in the spotlight dream about a chance in the spotlight. We don't need abandoned babies in stairwells to remind us of the quality of our love. We don't need to scapegoat one drunk Indian with two frozen toddlers to prove we're all fear-infested animals unworthy of human anything, Tony. We're nature without human and fancy clothes masking a flaky skin and five feet of what our colons produce. Don't be naive, Tony. Well, why don't you say that publicly? Well, because they know it, Tony. We all know it. Why say it? We don't need to ask day after day, how long will a man lie in the earth ere he rot? One thing we know for sure is that he will rot. We will rot. Well, then cut the line from the fucking play and the gravedigger scene. Throw away the entire fucking play and forget Yorick and that we knew him. Try a Lear without Cordelia's death, a Caesar without a Brutus stab, and forget a thousand Hamlets staring at a skull and see if you can. No, no, you underestimate people, Tony. 
All right, I see. So like cardinals who rape children, we should what? Not hold anyone accountable? We should automatically promote them, move them around, perk them with a bigger diocese, one step closer to Pope? It's theater, Tony! Not the church. Where's the difference? We entertain. I said, where's the difference? I applaud the critics of our small, insignificant world of theater, you know, who have the ovaries to criticize Canadian theaters for relying on American and British hits to subsidize their season. I mean, where's the fucking backbone in this corpse? What have we here, a man or a fish, dead or alive? And how is it that a dead theater critic is more alive and relevant than our present day theater? I mean, who's gonna argue with Nathan Cohen? Nathan Cohen who said theater today is a graveyard, a happy hunting ground over which lie scattered the bones of many a promising talent where the speculators who run theater want us to believe the wasteland they have created is an oasis. But the truth is it's an island of desolation. Each day is a new day. The drama absorbs nothing from yesterday and leaves nothing for tomorrow. Opinions are amusing, but convictions are frightening. Prejudice is proper, but passions are prohibited. The theater connects itself to nothing. I mean, who's gonna argue with that? I will. You know why? Cohen was referring, referring to American theater, not Canadian theater. To the period that gave us The Iceman Cometh, Death of a Salesman, Streetcar, Long Day's Journey, and a hundred other American plays that are the bread and butter of our contemporary Canadian theater. I mean, no fucking pussycat that Cohen. He branded New York, New York theater critics as Sweeney Todd's of critics, as a gullible and tender hearted crew. That's Cohen. You can only imagine what he said about Canadian theater, but he did warn that unless we take our embryo theater away from the speculators and draftsmen and critics, unless we give it back to the actor, the writer and the discriminating audience will wake up one bright Christmas morning to find out that our theater has neither a present nor a future. Wow, fuck, look at that. Dead at 47 and relevant at 37 years dead. If Canadian theater were to ever do something truly remarkable and positive, a self-inflicted gun wound to the head would be a good place to start just to finish the job. Wow, Tony, you do this every night with the, yeah, what? Well, deliver the whole letter to one person? Yeah, well, most nights, you know, and most nights that one person is me. Well, maybe we should take this thing over there, Tony. Which thing? I mean, your thing. Oh, where there? Well, you like it here? Well, it's free. Yeah, well, it's empty. It's still free. You're dying, Tony. I thought we all were. Oh, my God, a new letter? Yeah, it should be. Well, you belong there, Tony, in our town, you know. That's where you can get your wings. My God, it's like a promise of eternal life. Well, if that's how you want to put it, Tony, I wouldn't say you're putting it badly. No, I don't crave that kind of immortality, you know. It has a visible limit. I always feared knowing in advance the cemetery I'd be buried in. Oh, that hurts, Tony, if one allows it to. It should hurt. Not that I want it to. It hurts me to say it to you, and I wish I didn't have to. You know, I've had many offers of eternal life in my life, even from you. With each one, my life seemed to be getting shorter. Many conditions this time, Tony, but not too many, okay? No, even one is too many. Compromise, Tony. Come on, it's an art. Don't mock it. And even, you know, when successful, more perks will roll your way than you've ever fucking dreamed of. You'll have all the time in the world to rant, even howl at the moon, and people will actually pay to see it. There's a plan, Tony. No, I want to learn, not teach. I want to explore, not set to impress. I don't want to compete against anyone, but an inner standard. Compromise does not allow for that. Life does not allow for it, Tony, even to the best, and even the best are those looking to be great, had friends who could for them. I can for you, Tony. I am that friend. Don't be stupid, use me at will. Learn how to use me, Tony, without letting me see the how. Learn the fine, delicate art of nature, Tony. And as long as it attains something for someone, hopefully many, as long as the results are pleasing to all the parties involved, the means are acceptable, even forgivable. Even Goethe promises to forgive you, Tony. Even to those who sold it to the devil, he promises that he who strives on and lives to strive can still earn redemption. No, he spoke for his times. I'm speaking for hours. In me is the we, Tony. Don't be a fool, Tony, because time is continuous, but you're not. No, time is walking to the tune of a melancholy church bell. This is your time to make it up to time, Tony. Reclaim or make peace with time and redeem yourself. Set an example. No, I don't know that I can bleed the team colors. Try, Tony, without losing your own color. Think of blooming even this late in the game. I don't offer money, Tony. I only offer a home, a home connected to the universal, to the classics of the world, in which our present brings the past to life. A home connected to history and committed to making history, Tony. A home for your talent. Think of your talent, not yourself, Tony. No, like most from the South, I learned from birth how to endure hardship and develop an allergy to blooming. Machiavelli spoke of it, you know, but his poverty was relative. Mine was real. His allowed him to master the pen. Mine was barely good enough to quote him. Well, he spoke for his time, Tony. Let's speak for hours. No, 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 no! He speaks to hours! 
and we're destined to fucking quote him till we get him right. All right, Tony, your choice. No. Or what? Or ours? Or yours? No, no, Tony, ours. That's right. Mi casa, tu casa. You tell me, Tony, your closet drama here at Artcore or your set of wings at my theater there. I did. All right, Tony, drinks on me later. Yeah, hopefully I'll have something to celebrate. There always is, Tony, always. And he cobblestones away, voice exercising his heart out with the croon. You know, that optimism is his best side, the reason for his everything. Many love him for that, I do. I mean, we'd practically gone down on each other when we first met, that close, you know, that fucking close and that far. The prince excels in two things, paying the least to get the most and often paying the most to get the least. A perfect nation builder for a country with pimples where the old Calabrian proverb applies. Today you get fucked and tomorrow again. Hey, Tony, what? What about the Motosua thing play, you know? Uh huh? Is that a soul pepper thing? Well, I didn't know there was such a thing as a soul pepper thing, but then again, I had no idea Chekhov was writing a string of soul pepper things. But that's not his fault. I mean, I'm just not, you know, I'm not very learned, you know. I'm hindered by that earthy common sense of a Calabrian peasant. And a modo suo stems from that. Well, what's it about, Tony? Oh, you know, a teenage Muslim girl dies at the hands of her father. You're kidding me, Tony. That was like in the paper, like just recently. Yeah, I know, but I wrote it almost 20 years ago in Calabrian. You know, Calabrian Muslim, same shit. You know what I mean? A love poem to my sister. I believe you have a copy rotting on your desk. Our friend, Tony, which one? Well, our closest, yeah, what about him? Well, he told me you wrote a 300-page letter to your sister once, 300 pages? He overlaughs, plays with his curveball, you know, and waits for an explanation he can howl at. I just want him to fucking stew in his silence and the hell of his own words. It's harder to deal with the hatred of, of the self than the hatred that comes from others. One consumes, the other keeps you alive. I don't want to give him more reasons for living. I love him, so I want him to keep earning his own reasons. Yeah, I sent that letter to her two years ago, you know, where I feared she'd do with my cleaver ghosted one year later with the cleaver. The letter apparently made a difference, you know, but she was just flattering me, I'm sure, you know. Hey, I'm glad you both could see the humor and laugh at it, you know. Just like Chekhov, you know, who saw the funny and everything. And by the way, it was only 150 pages. Well, why don't you write a play, Tony, one that tackles the issues of the day? Well, what content do you have in mind for me to tackle? Well, the one that ennobles, Tony, that doesn't take down what we put up. There's betrayal in that. I see. Are we not worthy of comedy, drama, or tragedy? The play's the thing, Tony. Don't forget, Shakespeare took all of that from everyone and turned it into great drama. Well, I don't claim to be a writer, you know, or to have a plan. I'm caught in the mystery. It's far more everything than the knowledge of any one thing. But you are right. The play is the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. Call my assistant, Tony. We'll talk, all right? Come by the theater. We'll have a drink. And he croons under my skin, all of me, all the way to the young center, like old blue eyes. You know, there's a posthumous feel to the moment. I hate death, you know, but I respect it enough to not run away from her. Like my enemies, I keep her close so she can give me life. And there are times when you know there's room for more levels of shit that you haven't hit bottom yet. Curious about what you may find there, you go for the drink. And so I walk into the young center and I feel ancient, at one with the building, but not with the sect. The closing night faithful scattered all over the lobby. A co cocktail film without sound. Familiar faces that used to overcompliment my every move when I wore the team color. Now unfamiliar as they paced memory smiles on their tight jaws for the camera. Me, but opt to give me more of their backs than their fronts. A close-up is not what they want, but what they fear. And I think, you know, this fear invited rumor in to leave a mark. A chorus of well-trained ears and no voice. A cuckoo's nest farm, like many all over the fucking country where actors who spend a lifetime in schools fine-tuning their voice and body for maximum expression now practice the art of deaf-mute, as tribute to Chief Bromden. Wow, here's a silence for the ages, you know, a distilled and triumphant hush our city poet would relish and be proud of. I mean, no fear of a Galileo here, I thought. And these are the people apparently qualified to give voice to the voice of history, to kings and queens, and the list of misunderstood heroes and villains. Good God, could Dante have described a worse hell than this? And so I stand by the bar, alone in exile, smack in the middle of the largest city in the country, an exile that gave birth to two letters, and I'm thinking this bar is a perfect altar for this cathedral of silence. Silence, this ministry of truth. Hit me like a patron just before the show, Joe, the bartender. Give me your fucking best stuff. I want in. Target my brain, Joe. Give me the drink that makes me forget I had a drink. I'll take the loss. You take my money, okay? And take my memory, too. It's on the house. 
A Billy Bibbit actor without stutter approaches me. Before he utters a word, it's clear he doesn't want to slit his throat in a doctor's office. He starts and finishes a sentence without a glitch. He's an actor who writes, and he saw two letters, and he wants to thank me, told his young theater friends about them. They're reluctant to see them, he says. They've heard that they should stay away from the letters. He told them that they're everything that they've studied and believed in. The letters confirm, but they didn't believe him. And so he wishes me luck, and he disappears into the crowd, stuttering like a pro. And then, bingo, out of nowhere. A fedora with a bullwhip and a smile. Mr. Epidemic of Fear himself, ready for an encore. Hey, buddy, Tony, that was close in the laneway earlier. I mean, I thought we'd have to fucking get into it, Tony, you know? But it was explained to me, thank God. I thought, you know, what am I gonna have to do? Drop my fucking gloves and get into it with Tony? Because I was ready, man, Tony. Fuck, man, oh, man, Tony, you know what a fucking... Yeah, I said, you look pretty angry in the... Oh, man, oh, man, Tony. I was like, fuck, you know? You are one lucky man. I just wanted to, but I got to thank you, Tony. I had a great fucking show tonight, you know? I took all that fucking anger on stage, man, and I fucking rocked, Tony. I was so fucking hot. I burned a hole right through the fucking stage, man. They could feel it. I was so pumped, Tony. It was like, man, oh, man. It was like you, okay, or the play. And I chose the play, Tony. I killed that play tonight, Tony. I ate and chewed and killed every fucking ounce of that play. It's dead. So you are lucky, man, Tony. But I thank you. I'm going to keep an eye on you, Tony, because you bring me luck, you fuck. And I'm thinking, and if Goneril, you know, can kill a sister while preaching, I love you more than words can wield the matter, what will this brand of humanity do to a brother packed with ignorance, is strength, and nothing else? What did you say, Tony? No, nothing. I was saying it to myself, you know, my thinking's very weak, but very loud. You know what you're doing, Tony, sounds interesting. You know, love to see you. You're, you're going to, all oh, right, no, I have to leave tomorrow. I'll be back. Oh, you close, man, oh, man, Tony, that laneway thing, you know, man, good to see you, Tony. And he goes for me, this fucking Caliban. All raw nature, body odor and sandstorm breath. He smacks his lips right in the fucking tender part of my fucking neck and he sucks like a fucking lover. Son of a bitch! I knee jerk my hand to the two holes I expect to find where Dracula leaves his mark, you know? Oh, no holes, good God. But fuck, I feel weak. No ecstasy of St. Teresa weak. No, no, we're close. A weakening of the knees, yeah. A spear in my scrotum through my neck, oh yeah. In my head, I'm bleeding old Calabrian blood like a virgin all over the young center lobby. Tony, you're pale, you okay? Don't fucking touch me! And then I leave and I talk to Shakespeare, you peacock of nightmare, this tree of villain, a cast of characters in just one character, a Tybalt, a teenage hothead. And with a smile in one hand and a dagger in the other, he'll throw a strike right down the middle, you know, leaving the carving of the pound of flesh to Shylock while grinding and mincemeating your fucking heart to a halt. An Edmund! In later years, smart but mean, who celebrates his victimdom, obsessed with power and inheritance. I may be blind like his father, but I'm the first one to admit I blush from embarrassment at the sight of such a bastard of medieval England. And he ripes into an honest Iago of a man in search of his Othello. Next, he'll blame me for fucking his wife behind his back. A black ram tupping a white ewe, as he would put it. And finally, an ugly pile of humanity, a hunchback, rudely stamped, the form unfinished, sent before his time into this breathing world, scarce half made up, determined to prove a villain and hate the idle pleasures of these days. I mean, a fucking a couple of live ones like this guy. And you got the beginnings of something, you know? You never know where it could lead, but you do know that any war, civil or world, is in that kind of DNA and reaction and fear. Goddamn rumor. Did you enjoy the show? I swivel to the voice of the doorman. I didn't sleep, because I didn't see it. <sighs> yes, even tonight, we died at the bar. I hit the cobblestones. I walked by Artcore, stopped for a second, and taken the surroundings like a tourist impressed only with being from out of town, expecting others to be impressed by that too. And then I walked some more, you know, and I run into jazz, playing the devil's horn by the gates. Not trying to convince you of anything, you know, just that crisp, cold, distilled sound of despair that's not doing it for you, but for the times, potent, but isolated, where even the buildings and the street turned their backs to it. A sunny Rollins on a dark bridge of doubt in search of resurrection. Jazz waits till I'm about two feet past him and the gates, and then he says, hey, you're saying one thing, but they hear another man. You give them that, you get this. Use a character like I use my horn. There's a lot I'm saying, but I ain't saying it. The horn says it for me. That they can take. I use my voice, they'll cut my throat. I play this devil, they'll give me loonies. Defend my voice, and if I'm lucky, a record contract. I say it, I'm dead. The horn says it, my family eats. It's sick, I know, but it's the truth. Just find the vaccination. Well, you thank Jazz. You leave the distilled ossuary and you go home. No, you walk home. No fear of being ambushed by anyone who's seen two letters. No fear at all of that, you know, because no one's seen them. 
So you're safe to walk 100 miles if you have to, and you can take your time, and I do, but pay attention to the lights and rules, Tony. It's Hogtown Confidential, where you're more likely to get, be arrested for jaywalking and fiscal imbalance than for just about anything else. It's Toronto. You're that irrelevant. So think your thoughts, and I do. And then the rest is all in slow motion. I led with my right foot off the curb. That I remember. You know, in life, like in Hitchcock, you're the man sitting at the doomed desk and don't even know it. You're left with a mystery you may never have the time to solve, not from this side. I knew what was coming. And like most things that happen to you, you think they're happening to somebody else. I knew I was gonna be hit from behind. And I knew there was nothing I could fucking do. I didn't even close my eyes. You know, there'd be no time for that. And boom, was he drunk? Did he even see me? Didn't matter, I was hit badly. Did he have his lights on? Was the driver on a fucking phone, a cell phone? You know, I got caught in an English traffic moment. I looked left when I should have been looking right, a one-way street I took for a two-way. I was in the hospital a day or a month, I forget. The Ativan, Valium and morphine and whatever else they gave me was that good. Bandage, banged up, broken ribs, punctured lungs and whatever else they could. IVs, blood pressure barely hanging in there. Very mild head injuries, but lots of internal bleeding from the neck down and lots of trauma experts making split second decisions. Some calling family, preparing them for the worse. And I was still holding onto the fucking thought I was thinking when I crossed the one way street, looking the wrong way. Find a way, Tony, come on, to tap into that mad money, that moolah, that payola that multiplies like rabbits and heating up the real estate. Find the fucking funding, Tony. Or wait, Tony, no, 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 go the other extreme. Free tickets, free tickets on the radio and TV, free for our neighbors and restaurants and the distillery, free for, I don't know, all the dead people, free for everyone in all the cemeteries and mausoleums in Toronto. I mean, I'm just thinking, you know, freebies, freebies. What better funding method, you know? Or be paid to see it. Times are tough for many. We'll even pay the audience, you know, for their sitter and transportation. I mean, didn't some New York actress offer her savings to the winning ticket holder night after night? What's wrong with that? That got them in. I don't know how it ended, but a good way to start. I mean, she too must have run into a community leader one day, at some point, one who told her there was no money, but he could round up people the way cowboys round up cattle, and that a massive quantity of live beef would be deposited at the theater door. But no, we did the smarter thing. You know, we gave sponsor status to those who gave us little or nothing, you know? Not even a case of wine to drown our pathetic self-pitying selves in. We banked on La Bella Figura while making fun of it. And our reward? Colo colorotto senza cerasse. Only Italians can actually make sense of this mule-inspired logic, and I, being a mule and an Italian, fell into it like a minnow biting the hook made for a shark. Oh, fuck, I gotta do my taxes while I'm in the hospital bed. You know, I must have said it out loud, because the nurse or doctor told me I had other things to worry about. But if she allowed me to fucking pursue my logic, she would have seen that I was worrying about other things. My family and taxes was a way into it. A net loss, a write-off my life for the year. This is good, I said to myself. You know my eyes trained to see loopholes, the same eyes that failed to see the car coming when it hit me? Miraculously fell on a memory of a life insurance policy, critical whatever it's called, you know, illness and stuff and death. I mean, I may be wounded, but still living. Not good, this is not good. And according to that piece of paper, I'm worth more dead than alive. Jimmy Stewart had Clarence the angel when his wonderful life suddenly looked awful. I have an opportunity. Shouldn't I take it? I mean, my cleaver stuck in the neck ghost, you know, was kind of bored with the whole thing, life, and kind of okay with it. Neither here nor there, you know, a perfect Canadian. Doesn't hate things enough to kill them and doesn't love them enough to live them fully. Chronic suicide, a living death. Being dead is for the living. Dead is for the dead. No verb, nothing before it, nothing after. Just it, in it, frozen, choked, paused in time. That's what I was staring at in that bed, you know? That forever pause. But my cleaver stuck in the neck ghost is a living pause, as intense and timeless as death itself. He owns that fucking pause right now. He holds the copyright to it. You know, he has little interest in anything outside that pause for now, chronic existence. I know, I know, I know, you are what you attract, I know. But I can't be like him, I say to myself, even thinking what I'm thinking. And besides, I love my family, my philosopher boy, and he needs funding and food, he needs toys, he needs, and my death, if orchestrated and structured in a certain way, might just give him that. No dramaturgs, please, I tell the nurse. They'll fuck it up and save me. You know, all these years they've been killing writers they were supposed to help, and now that I would need them to do what they do best, kill, they're probably gonna fucking save me, fuck them. No visitors, nurse. I need time alone, nurse. You know, since 81, manager keeps whispering in my ear that each man kills himself in his own selected ways. Had I made my choice when crossing that desolate street at night deep in my bullshit, had I chosen suicide by inches, 
yes, yes, yes. But I'd be taking action with my death, I thought, you know. Only those who don't try to think it's cowardly and easy to kill yourself. Try, try asking those who attempted or succeeded. It's fucking hard. Why don't they give awards for that? With any luck, I may even get the same quality of hospital care that sealed my father's fate. You know, he had me to look after him, and he still didn't make it. I don't have a me to look after me. This is good. The odds are in my favor, in a strange kind of way. Now let's hope one of those I can kill you in two second doctors makes an appearance and injects me with a generous but undetectable helping of local anesthetic, some lethal happy hour cocktail of lidocaine or bubiocaine or whatever the fuck else doctors inject into wives they want to get rid of quickly. Here's the fucking spot doctor on my fucking neck. Go for it. I won't tell it. You son of a fucking bitch. Hit me. End it now, Tony, not for you. Your family, think of your family. You've lived well, give back, leave a legacy, Tony. Make an insurance company or a brochure proud and angry at the same time. Be a perfect, imperfect ending. That's a good thing for everyone, you know? And it kind of worked from time to time, Tony. Seneca, Socrates, even Christ, didn't that happen? Or is this medication making me think it did? Is the medication making me think all of it? Jesus Christ, son of Mary and Joseph and the donkey that took them to Bethlehem. And what about my philosopher boy who recently asked me, who's the oldest in the family, Papa? I said, I am. Well, then you will be the first one to die, Papa. No, I said, many, 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 many years from now, son, and you will go on for many, 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 many years after that. Let's put on some music, son, okay? Your choice, the Beatles, Frank, Led Zeppelin, Wizard of Oz, whatever you like, son, and let's sing our fucking hearts out, play drums, guitar, piano, anything you like. Kashmir, Papa, okay. okay. Plant has a voice as high as the wind, Papa. Okay, wow. Wow, that's beautiful. You want to write that down? Sure, Papa. How do I spell it? Well, here's a pen. It belonged to my father. You're no, no. You can have it. I don't want it, Papa. Passed away is not a father. And I stepped onto the other side of the street. Not a scratch. The turbulence of the speeding idiot still in the air. But behind me, my beautiful, 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 beautiful boy had taken me across the street by the hand, even as he lay sleeping in his bed. He slips me the answer to questions I don't remember asking him. All the money in the world can't buy that kind of insurance. And so I write some more, not as a character, but as myself. Fuck jazz. Not deciding on who to, where to, not even sure how to anymore. I light up and shoot out a thousand emails a day, like those cheap homemade fireworks on Victoria Day, you know, that make few people happy, but might actually burn your house down if your neighbor had his way. All the bits and body parts of this post-fucking-mortem, this corpse with funding as entry point, a forensic and clinical autopsy to determine cause of death and how such death of culture can be prevented in the future. It's a cute story and light and meant to be that way. That was the idea. But I couldn't move. My hands stuck and the computer waits. And an army of dramaturgical ghosts from letter one and two gnaw at my skull and pulling and yanking at the fucking insides like reins and won't stop until it's clear that I'm coming to a close for good. Wrap it up, Tony, it's overload. But why should I be concerned with fucking coming to a close? Our lives are coming to a close. Why should I be concerned with that, with this? Shouldn't it be about prolonging? Let others cut, edit, and discard if they want, when they want. And now, like an ambushed Kennedy by the grassy knoll, more matter off than on my head, dangling brains, perfect worms for hungry birds, then on cue, 10,000, count them, 10,000 Canadian actors, a giant union of actors, a conference of little fucking vampires, digging in, right in my fucking head, perfecting their hell. As their contribution to world-class theater, some swim upstream sperm-like to crash my inner hard drive and take it and smash on it. And I say, I'm astounded! And counting, and that became the title. And it wrote itself, like the rest. And I say, too many things astound me. And you list them. It's always a timing thing, I know. Timing is everything in comedy, drama, and business opportunities. Wars declared, those averted. I mean, does a car leaving from one end of town know anything about the car leaving at the other end? And that in 20 minutes they'll collide at an intersection? And that one or possibly two will die? Who had the advanced knowledge of the timing? Is that not timing we calculate in reverse? to make sense of something that does not seem to make any sense? Or is it to avoid responsibility? Or was it timing from the outset as a set piece? The enemy is an insidious virus, I tell him. It takes up residence in our body, afflicting even those who claim they belong to a select group that can't contract it. Those part of the inner circle, believing they have an understanding and awareness those outside simply lack. Those so nervous, so furious at this mouth, these hands, they discover three octaves of passion they never knew they had but unfortunately wasted on protecting their ass. Those who would rather invite me to an evening of film 
the old films, the ones I shot 10 years ago or more, like La Sarrazine, the ones that portray Italian immigrants as fucking victims, because they reinforce who and what we are, lest we forget victims. Films important in their time, as today, but they're a starting point. They are seeds, not monuments to sit on. Those who pass judgment on a film they've never seen, La Deroute, believing it points the finger at those poor sons of bitches who cross the Atlantic to give their children a better home and education. They'll have none of that, they tell me. How dare anyone make fun of them, Tony? They, like the Quebecois hairdresser on the film, couldn't see, didn't want to see that Joey Yellow is an Italian in Quebec, is Quebec is anything and anyone whose fear defends a culture in a way to the death. And the rightness of his feelings does not justify the righteousness of his actions and may even kill the one thing he loves the most, his child. What does two letters have to say to them anyway, Tony? Give us those works that know how to play soundtrack to the pain of our injustice. And what's wrong with inviting you to a conference, Tony, where we meet the artists, brag about ourselves, try to make ourselves relevant with the irrelevant works we offer, and body checking each other out of the lineup to munch on the paltry but tasty finger food so generously offered by the venue, the only reason we actually go to these things? What's wrong with mimicking Fellini, Tony, Scorsese, and Coppola? So what if we don't know how to, Tony, but we're trying? And look how far we've come, Tony. Cops no longer hit College Street and St. Clair Avenue with a billy club in their brain with the sole purpose of making sure WAPs don't congregate outside espresso bars. Why can't you catch up, Tony, and embrace the eventful and glorious history of this great nation, Tony? Did you not see Kamal's Seven Wonders of the Theater World, Tony? Did you fail to notice that this great city of ours, Toronto, made the list and the Paris, Rome, and Berlin were not even on the list, Tony? Why can't you appreciate the positive and not excavate or fabricate the negative, Tony. Why are you not a nation builder, you destroyer? Why can't you just kick back and relax, Tony? Why harp on the internment and not even meditate on Vimy? Are you not like some lunatic, unabashedly promoting two letters, Tony, delusional in thinking it has any value whatsoever? I don't know. I don't know, I can only speak for the conditions that provoke two letters after 30 years working in the theater and film where a comfortable, accommodating mediocrity, notwithstanding the talent has, for the most part, ruled the day. And the many people I've met over the last year have only shown me more of what provoked those letters. And that is a pity. But I thank those who left their home to meet me here at this intersection without a glitch or nightmare. It's a miracle, you know. Little triumphs are little only for the well until they're sick. Now put a plastic over them, Tony. Deprive them of oxygen, you know, and put them away like dead crystals in a china cabinet, though seen but rarely used. And polish them every once in a while so they look good. And so I stare at the stack of unpaid, unopened bills at home and an invitation to the Door Awards. Two letters was nominated. The ceremony is tonight. Wow, Dora, short for Dorothea, Isadora, Theodora. Not sure, Greek for gift or God, gift of God or goddess. Wow, gift of God. The Doras, the celebration of gifts. You know the thought of seeing a horde of mainly fear-plagued, glory-hungry theater gargoyles straight from Dante's hell, lowest hell, did not appeal to me. Attendance in Toronto theater had been apparently universally low last year. Two letters could certainly vouch for that, along with the patronizing refrain, well, don't take it personally, Tony. Of course I took it personally. We must. Yet more people will line up to see the Dora Awards than practically any single theater event of the year. Many more will remain outside with no ticket, desperately wanting in. A night celebrating a largely irrelevant theater year will become the most relevant night in the theater. What would I say to my colleagues? Should I be chosen to make an acceptance speech? What would I say about this ego theater, well-dressed Buddhas with our backs curled all the way down in admiration of what we see? Wait, no, I thought, maybe I should embrace it, I thought. Maybe attendance is not the problem, but the choice of plays. Maybe we should produce only Dora shows, 365 days a year, bypass all the other stuff. We should have award shows for the best award show, and award show for the, those who won the award shows, the most of them, a freak award show for those who won the least, and then one for those who've never won anything in their fucking lives. One for the best among the worst. God, we'd be packed every night. We wouldn't even have to rely on regular audience members, you know, those not in the theater. Fuck them, go home. What better audience members than those in the theater? Who can understand theater better than those who create and practice it, you know? Weren't we always doing it for ourselves, for and f to each other, you know? No, I should go, I thought. Mm, I'm gonna go. And so I called the doors and asked why I had not been invited there and given a five minute spot in the award show to share a piece of my two letters. And could we negotiate even two minutes? I mean, it's not like we're breaking new ground. I mean, Sasheen Littlefeather took care of that years ago at the Oscar in front of a world audience. Anything I'd say would pale by comparison. It's the Doras. 
for crying out loud, celebrating the tiniest gifts of God, the marked down gifts, the size of homeopathic pellets without the healing. Well, when we know we will have no more awards show, Tony, uh, Dora awards show, that is, that's when you can do it, she said. I mean, people in the theater don't have the sense of humor you think they do, Tony. Just today I got a call, ton of calls, you know, and emails from crybabies who didn't get nominated or nominated for the wrong thing or in the wrong year or category or not nominated enough that new categories were not created for the particular brand of genius and that the jury's failure to see, acknowledge, and celebrate their genius is what's wrong with our theater. How do you put two letters in that, Tony? No, that's exactly where two letters belong, I said. And then a call from Costa Rica announcing the death of my father-in-law. It was shortly after 6 p.m. and I was still in pajamas. I stayed home. And then the journalist who feared people were taking the bar dangerously below sea level, remember him? Didn't want to drown? Well, that journalist took his life. And then the Mickey Rooney of Hungary, whose energy lit an entire prairie city, Saskatoon, and my heart. And then more deaths, and then more deaths. And so you hit a funeral home for the third, fourth, or fifth time in less than a year and stare at someone who was too young to die, even if he'd been old, you know, and with so much to give beyond what he had already given, and it was a lot, who spoke of Dante and liked Dante like he had written him. And I stare at him lying in his coffin and compare him to the way my father looked in his coffin and the other unfortunate bastards whose only resemblance to each other was the stupid makeup they wore and the blood drained from their bodies through their vascular pipes until their tap run dry. And I thought, nothing spiritual about this gathering. No wisdom to be drawn from this living room setting in nightmare. Old parents should never attend a son's funeral, and young children should never attend a father's. But this guy and family were dealt both blows, a double whammy. And I hold a skull in my mind like a crystal ball of who he was. I look for any sign of life as if I'd find any, you know? I'm sure the first thing he'd say would be his best, you know? But the dead never talk to us. They tell us what we tell them to tell us. We talk to ourselves through them and give them credit for saying what we say they said, but they never did. Because we don't like to be on our own. Why should we? Well, tired of talking to myself, I talk to him. I throw him a couple of oughts and shoulds, knowing he won't hold them against me, not in this world. I tell him things he doesn't fucking need to know, but that I need to tell him. I tell him the theater like death should make you want to run out of the building and yell, take a gun to your head, make love with the first stranger you meet, dive into the Trevi Fountain, sans clothes, throw all your fucking pennies into the fountain, make you feel the pain of the entire goddamn universe, including the dead, give you a 140 degree fever, resurrect Fred Astaire and dance with him as an equal, abolish hunger in the world, even in your own country, abolish pedophilia in every pedophile, because to kill all pedophiles is to kill all men and the world needs men but healthy kill the pain in every child killer and save every child about to be killed by man or bomb by man or flood and kill when necessary even dressed as mother Teresa if you have to turn the other cheek when facing bullets but fucking stare the trigger in the eye dodge the bullets as if you were the one who could but walk on water for the strength in your feet and drown in it when the power goes to your head play that guitar that violin piano solo in your own variation walk down that stairway all the way to your close-up your last one even when it's your first one your last one because the one fucking thing theater should never do is to make you feel immortal it's only about the fucking mortal. Even in the top hat and tails and pennies from heaven and singing in the fucking rain, it's always about digging your nails into the skin of the one you love or love to hate or hate that you love because he or she is the closest to you in every way. And if you are lucky, you'll be lying next to him or her in the marble orchard because the time after this waits, stares, is so fucking long and not that far away. And every him or her you meet today might be the one you meet that day, lying next to you, pushing the same daisy. Theater should stun you into reflection and propel you into action that has no history, but steeped in its wisdom. It's not voltage, it's essence, it volumes itself. Well, this solemn and too fucking sad of a moment was interrupted by a palpitating idiot, another university professor, who introduced to me other palpitating brains, a strong supporter of this guy, you know, one who supports from a distance and tells his illustrious buddies that this is the best actor in the community. So great, one day he might even win the Canadian Oscar. We are hoping, you know, at least that's what we're hoping. He says, Tony, I'm sorry, you know. The others look on encouragingly with a smile that doesn't have the energy to last the duration of a smile. Like I was the corpse they were looking at, you know, putting all their thespian hopes into this basket, me, but expecting it to remain empty, knowing that this actor won't amount to much, you know? Most never do, but they do their best, you know, in the cautious and qualified support. They have difficulty masking 
takes me back to cod liver oil. The moment tastes like shit, but I know it's good for me, even necessary. I mean, we're in a fucking funeral home for fuck's sakes. And I turn to make sure the corpse is still there. I mean, it is, it could have run away. I would have understood, you know? I mean, the place was asking for grace and deserved it. We were giving it shit and deserved it. What an irony for the guy lying in a coffin, alive studying and teaching Dante, and now this, a bunch of gargoyles in a living hell. And so I left, and a headline from the Globe caught my eye. Scorsese or Eastwood, who's your pick? And that took me to the next thought. Wow, the genies, the Canadian Oscars were on last night, but you wouldn't know by reading the Globe or watching TV. No, nobody knows. But a lot of people won, even an actor or two. But just wait till they visit a funeral home and learn what they've won. Still smelling a funeral home, you hit your computer and you write, Dear Mr. Edward Greenspan at the Globe, I don't know what you discuss around a dinner table and if culture in any way becomes part of the conversation, but when I look at the Globe constantly advancing and promoting American culture, I'm not talking about ads, but actual articles, and not the creme de la creme at that, at the expense of Canadian culture, it's unbelievable. The Globe is not alone in this, I know. I mean, the genies were televised on Bravo. Bravo! You know, dog shows get more coverage, maybe even in this country. No, not maybe, not maybe. A huckleberry dog in Toronto gets two front pages, front page stories as a tribute to our humanity. A homeless person gone missing, like the dog, but never found, is forgotten. I mean, is Doyle the only thinking journalist writing on our pathetic TV and film industry? Or is he a lunatic, a crazy Irishman, allowed to voice his eccentric views on this and that subject? Or a lone Canadian voice reflecting the sentiments of thousands who, like him, want culture to be vibrant and relevant and not a banana republic? I agree with Doyle. There's too much love in Canadian comedy and not enough love, I would argue. Canadian comedy believes Canadian asses don't smell, never did. And they prove it by putting each other's noses up each other's asses, which is why they're so good at satire. You know, they know a chain is as strong as its weakest link, so they'll keep their noses deep in the roses, thank you. This nasus up the anus gives them an advantage over other Canadians. They can see what others can't. I don't think we can argue with that. And while Canadians perfect the art of hate, on city streets, Canadian comedy and culture looks for inspiration south of the border because it had apparently it's run out of material north of the border. Yes, Doyle, many things remind us as Canada is a nasty, small-minded, unsophisticated little country. An academic threw me a quote about academia that may apply to culture. He said, hey, the politics are so vicious, Tony, because the stakes are so low. Bastard takes me three letters, he does it with one sentence. Now shut up, Doyle, and go home, you Irish bastard, and let Canada run Canada, whoever they may be. But I know the founding nations and nowhere see your name, Doyle. I mean, we'll look for your obit, Doyle, and then we'll list the things you said that we didn't take seriously, but should have. And in our pathetic Canadian way, I mean, if the globe, especially the globe, if you can't, if it doesn't, if it won't, who will? Funerals are funny, you know, they have a way of reminding us our children and future generations will look back at what we've done with our culture. And when they do look back, one hopes we can still lie peacefully in our graves. You know, my fear is that like many people in past centuries who were buried alive, will relive our living death again with each new generation from inside our coffin, writhing in blood and excrement. We'll be scratching and trying to crawl our way out of the fucking grave so we can offer those future generations excuses and apologies. And that will be our legacy. Excuses and apologies. Thank you.